like to call this regular meeting of the Forest Hills Board of Education to order. Mr. Tepper, can you please call roll? Mrs. Bissinger? Here. Dr. Heiss? Here. Mr. Helmogarn? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. Mr. Fruman? Here. And if you join me for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We have four exits, one here, two there, one at the back. Uh, please take note of those. We have a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. Second. Mrs. Bissinger? Yeah. Yes. Dr. Heiss? Yes. Mr. Hemmelgaard? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Furman? Yes. And the first item of work is our pre-work session for our work session is to be held on February 8th uh, at 8 a.m. here. You're all welcome. Uh, Dr. Heiss, or, or Dr. Jackson, if you would please. Dr. Heiss, I will share the duties. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to, uh, to move up to the podium only so I can get a really good view of the, uh, of the screens. Um, what I'd like to do first this, uh, this evening is just to kind of give a little brief overview of what has recently occurred in regards to the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission as well as the a um, uh, little review of our community survey highlights. So with that, this where Jen, Jeannie's getting this up and going. Okay, um, Ohio's Fieldies Construction Commission's, uh, we're gonna start with the findings in that regards. The second slide here talks about the assessments and surveys. And this is a quick overview. Uh, when we talk about school facilities, this is a topic that's been in front of the board now for several years. And just going back a few years, you can see that in 04, um, we had a Ohio School Facilities Commission study that was, uh, was done for the district and we've used that information now for a few years. Uh, since 04, there have been a number of different uh, uh, facilities needs that have been addressed, a uh, number of different committees, um, uh, I think uh, four different committees, um, whether they be board committees or superintendent committees. Um, in 2010, um, there was a community survey that was conducted by Fallon Research and I'm gonna talk just briefly in a couple minutes and just maybe relate a couple of those questions to the most current survey. And then most recently here at the end of 2013, the board directed us to take a look at having the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission, which um, to come back and do a study uh, of all our facilities, an updated uh, study. And we have that that we're gonna talk just a little bit about this evening as a quick review. And then uh, most recently, at the end of the year, we had a our second community survey uh, done by Fallon Research. So with that, we'll move on and we'll start talking about a little bit about OFCC just for a moment. Um, you saw earlier that one was called the Ohio Schools Construction Commission and now it's the Ohio Facilities Construction uh, Commission. And quite frankly, they're primarily the same organization. The OFCC was actually formed in 2012 that actually then um, kind of intertwined the, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, architects and engineers as well as the Ohio School Facilities Commission together in one group, but it's primarily doing the same thing. Um, so um, moving on then, it says in September this year, we then talked to them about what was called uh, taking a look at our facilities in regards to an expedited uh, method possibly of utilizing them in regards to facilities. So what happened in September is we had a number of professionals come to each of our buildings. We spent at least a day at each of the buildings, if not more, and we brought a team of, um, of architects and engineers and other experts. And um, this same team went to each of the buildings, which was uh, very um, um, unique in that regard, rather than having lots of different people coming in. So each team got to see all of our facilities. They provided an assessment for us that we got right towards the end of the year, and I have a copy on my desk, or on my table here, which is this large white document, the white folder. Um, and they went into quite a bit of detail in regards to those that study. Jeannie? Um, now, I know this is kind of um, uh, small to read, but if you take a look at this, what they did is they assessed each of our facilities in 24 different categories. 
And just to look at a few, the heating systems, the roofing, our ventilation, air conditioning, electrical systems, plumbing and fixtures, windows, structures of foundations, structures of walls, uh, our floors, our roofs, our general finishes, our interior lightings, security systems, emergency and egress lighting, fire alarm systems, handicapped accessibility, site conditions, sewage systems, our water supply, uh, our exterior doors, our hazardous materials uh, within each of the buildings, if there were any, and any life safety issues in our buildings. Um, loose furnishings, and that's a variety of things, but just some of the, um, you know, as, as you go into the buildings, whether you have uh, different pieces of technology or different types of furnitures, or in the science labs in particular, they call some of that loose furnishings. Uh, our technology infrastructure, and then also some construction consistencies. Uh, contingencies, I'm sorry, contingencies. So the report that we got back, as I said, one for each of our nine buildings, uh, buildings addressed those nine, or 24 different assessment categories. Um, and the board received that, and it's been on our website now for several, several weeks that our community can take a look at as well. Uh, if you do happen to go to our website for the community, uh, those reports are very large. Actually, right in the beginning of those reports is a brief, not brief, it's a couple, three pages too, but a summary of each building. Those will probably take you through the information that you need and that's, you know, you really want to get into the nitty gritty. That's what this, the, the whole uh, study performs. So, Jeannie? Um, <coughs> so, again, in 2004, there were some consistencies with the 2013. And the main consist consistency between the two studies was, in both of those studies, was that Wilson exceeded what they determined as the two-thirds guidelines for triggering recommendations for replacement rather than renovation. Um, so, and then 2013, uh, just to kind of update you, in 2013, over that nine-year period, or actually, uh, yeah, nine-year period, uh, all six of our elementary schools exceeded the two-thirds guidelines by varying degrees. Our two high schools were nearing that, and Nagel had come up a few percentage points as well. So, okay. I think what's important for the two-thirds guideline, again, is it sets the replacement versus the renovation standards for our school facilities as that two-third margin. In other words, what the OFCC takes a look at is they say that if it really, it's kind of like, uh, you know, when you take a look at anything in your own possession, whether it be uh, something in your house or your car or whatever, if it's going to cost you much more to, or getting close to the cost of replacement versus renovating it or fixing it, then that's what we have to take a look at. So in this case, if you'll see the six elementaries um, from varying degree, if we start with Air Elementary, Air was built and opened in 1973. Um, they, this report came back and said that the replacement versus renovation was 75%. Maddox Elementary was opened in 1966. That was a 73% ratio. Mercer opened in 1973, a 76% replacement versus, a uh, renovation, excuse me, versus replacement. Sherwood, 72. Summit Elementary, built in 1959. Um, I'm sorry, Summit Elementary built in 1968, I'm sorry, 77%. And then Wilson Elementary, our oldest building, opened in 1959, and the numbers that came back was 105%. So to renovate Wilson as it sits, not including the modular units that are outside of Wilson, would cost us more to try to renovate it than to rebuild it. Nagel Middle School, our newest building, was opened in 1999. The report showed that it had a 26% renovation to replacement ratio. Anderson High School, our second oldest building, opened in 1961, it's had a couple of additions since then, has a 64% replacement to, or excuse me, renovation to replacement ratio. And Turpin, opened in 1976, has a 62% ratio. So I'm going to stop there for a moment and ask if there are any questions as we go through this. Now, I'm, again, I'm doing this prim primarily for our, our community and our audience because the board, we've seen this, you've seen this, these, these figures. Okay? What? Go ahead. Thank you. 
<coughs> what does the OFCC not assess? There was 24 items on there that they did assess. Can you tell us what they didn't look at? Um, they Mr. looked at Johnson, just maybe? about everything. Uh, well, right. I think what's not included in there are things like uh, auditoriums, uh, and auditoriums, uh, athletic facilities. Uh, they're going to look at a gym. This is part of the PE space, um, but you know, virtually any of the other athletic facilities aren't, aren't included in that. Thank you. <coughs> The weight room itself, part of it is included okay. because it does have part of the physical education classes Locker involved. Rooms, for example, that would be used from, you know, they're identified for athletics are included for those for BTR. Right. Are the swimming pools not? Swimming pools are not. And is that because they, when they give money, they don't give money for those items, correct? Actually, they do not give money for those items. That's what I said. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. No, <laughs> no, said, no, yeah, that's what I meant. They if do I not, didn't say they, it, yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, now we can come back and dis discuss the OFCC as we move along in your discussion and those types of things. But I also also want to share with you just some of the highlights of the most recent survey. Um, so we'll move along with that. Excuse me. Yeah. Go ahead, Randy. Right. So then, if, if you were to assess the cost of true replacement, that uh, calculation, that ratio is actually low because the, if we were going to replace, we'd replace it with a, a pool and a gym and other Correct. modest so athletic. The cost of renovating doesn't include renovating and <coughs> updating those facilities okay. as well. So whether it's renovating or replacement, they've left those out. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. Okay, uh, some of the community survey highlights. Uh, again, back in the late just a couple months ago, the board commissioned uh, the uh, scientific community survey to be conducted by Fallon Research. Uh, I think it's very important that the respondents that were randomly selected were all registered voters in Forest Hills. Um, the data was stratified uh, in a lot of different ways um, so that the differences are in vital characteristics such as age of our respondents, the race, their genders, their geography where they lived, and uh, were all representative proportion to their percentage of elector electorate. And then going back to the respondents themselves too, is that they were uh, a true cross representation of residents in the Forest Hills community. Uh, in regards to, uh, there were senior citizens that were surveyed, younger voters were surveyed, male and female, um, uh, in proportion to, and, and well, in proportion in regards to the. Uh, uh, residents that had students within Forest Hills as to residents that did not have students in Forest Hills. So <coughs> the, um, the makeup of this survey was truly a representation of our district. Uh, Dr. Jackson, yes, did, uh, did the school board or the uh, board office, the district office, had, have any say in who was Absol a part of that? Absolutely none, no. How did they, uh, how did they select them? Um, that's a great question. We'd have to <laughs> talk to Fallon okay. Research. But really, they were all registered voters, and they went to the voter uh, list and got a lot of that information from that in regards to, OK? <clears throat> OK. So moving along, and another reason I, w I want to start off with just remember, we had, they also did a 2010 survey. So it was a little, by, little, little over three years later when they completed their second survey. But I thought there was a couple things I'd just kind of point out quickly. And the first one, and these are just real positive things for the district, that in 2010, remember just a few years ago, over 80% of the district uh, is doing an excellent or good or fair job in spending tax dollars. So the question really said, in your opinion, how would you rate the job of the four years local school district that is done with spending? And you can see that they rated it excellent or good. That's the higher column at 57%, fair at 25, uh, nine poor or very poor, and nine unsure. Well, the reason I put that in because uh, Fallon asked a couple of the same types of questions just for some, for some research data that he uses. And so I thought that it was interesting that in this new survey, she, yeah, okay. In the new survey, the same question exactly, how would you, in your opinion, how would you rate the job of the Forest Hill School District uh, has done in spending your taxpayers' money in an effective, responsible manner? Um, the data went up from 57 to 68 percent excellent. So, and uh, fair uh, dropping to 18 from 25, and then six total of uh, very poor, poor, and also eight unsure. So those data is, is moving up. So I think that shows that our community, at least based on this survey, is 
has some pretty good, uh, um, um, fills a pretty good representation in regards to how we're doing and spending their money. So, in, in our district. Okay. <clears throat> Condition of facilities, and I'm sorry, I should have made these bars just a little bit larger. But let me kind of just go through, there's just a couple slides with some data points on it. The first question that I'm sharing is, it says in general, here's the question. Do you, th do you think that Forest Hills local school districts, school buildings and classrooms are good facilities that need no major improvements, adequate c facilities that need some updating but no rebuilding, or poor facilities that need to be replaced? Or do you not have enough information at this time for your, or, um, for your opinion? So let's go back to that. So people that said good were just 6% that says that, um, that they are good facilities that need no major improvements. 47% um, said adequate. In other words, that they need to be some updating or renovating, but no rebuilding. 14% said poor that they need to be replaced. And then we have an, a 30% who is saying no opinion. And I think that's very important. If you take a look at this, now again, I'm not trying to, I'm just saying if you just look at the numbers here, 30% is saying that they, they really don't have a good idea about our facilities. So remember, if you take, go back to the, the group of respondents, that a lot of those people were not that familiar with our district because they did not have students in our district or other means as well. Okay, so that's just kind of one of the questions as we get started here. <coughs> uh, Paul Fallon, or Fallon Research, asked about a couple of our buildings, the oldest buildings, and we'll begin with Wilson. And this question said, do you think that Wilson Elementary School should be replaced, renovated, or have nothing done to it at this time? Or are you just unsure? So across the board there, you can say replaced. 29% of everyone that was surveyed said replaced. 26% say renovated. Nothing, 12%, and unsure again, 34%. <coughs> now, when you break this question, and I took a look at some of the data, if you look at the parents' response to this, since they knew about, I mean, people that are familiar with our district, that number of replaced is a little higher. Okay, Anderson. The second oldest building in our district, the same question was asked. Do you think that Anderson High School should be replaced, renovated, or have nothing done to it at this time, or no opinion, or unsure? 10% of the respondents said replace. 54% says renovate. 18% said do nothing to Anderson, and 17% were unsure. So between the two buildings, if you go back to, well, we won't go back, but if you remember, that unsure dropped from 34 to 17%. So people have a little better opinion, I think, of Anderson High School. And more people are saying renovated than replaced as opposed to Wilson. So, okay. Jeannie? Okay. Uh, one of the questions um, was, do you think that it's a good or a bad idea to merge the two high schools into a single new one in order to save money or lower operating cost? 26% say it's a good idea to consolidate one high school from two. 65% said it's a bad idea um, to consolidate two high schools to one. And 9% said unsure. Okay. And on that same consolidation question, we talked about the elementaries as well. Question regarding the elementary schools, generally speaking. Do you think it is a good or a bad idea to consolidate elementary schools and reduce the number of them if the ratio of student and teachers remain the same and the individual class sizes did not increase? So when we take a look at a similar type of question in regards to the elementaries, you can see that 52% thinks it has some merit, it's a good idea, 40% said bad idea, and 8% said unsure with consolidating from the number that we have now, six to something smaller, if the um, student-teacher ratios remain the same or individual class sizes did not increase. Now this is the overall people. When I took a look at the parents' respondents, they were a little higher in regards to, um, bad idea, it was a little higher <laughs> in regards to consolidating. But overall, the general community um, thought that it was uh, right around that 50% mark. Okay, a couple more. 
A quick question uh, regarding renovations and updates. Question was, how important would you say it is for Forest Hills Local School District to get updated and renovated school facilities and classrooms? Okay, how important is it that we take a look at our facilities and update them? That's the question. 32% said very much. 50% said somewhat. 11% said not at all. Four, or not very, I'm sorry. 4% said not at all and 2% unsure. So if you take the very or somewhat, and as Paul Fallon would usually do and put those together as a somewhat positive response, that 82% of the people that were surveyed says it's very important for us to take a look at updating and renovating our facilities. Okay. Another question. Next question, Jenny. Thank you. <clears throat> Funding for maintenance. Something that we've talked a little bit about, a lot about. Question was, how much priority should it be to provide funding for ongoing maintenance and upkeep of our existing school buildings to preserve them and prolong their use? Again, maintenance monies, and as everyone knows, we've talked about on a number of occasions, our current maintenance dollars come from the general fund. So what this question says is how much of a priority would it be to provide funding for ongoing maintenance? 59% said a very high priority, 32% said a medium priority, eight low priority, zero not a priority, and 2% unsure. So the majority of our people, 59 plus 32%, so 91% uh, think it is a, somewhat of a priority, if not a high priority, to look at providing some funding for some ongoing maintenance of our facilities. Okay, just a couple more learning spaces, getting to the, uh, what we do, is teach and, and, uh, and, and uh, students learn. Question, how much priority should it be to build additional science, life sciences, computer labs in the high schools so that there are enough to ensure that our students have sufficient access to them? Okay, additional science and upgraded science labs and life science labs and technologies. 55% said that's a very high priority. 32% said a medium priority. Eight low, one not a priority, and four unsure. Okay. Security. How much of a priority should it be to improve and upgrade our security, uh, these security, I'm sorry, and monitoring systems to prevent unauthorized entry into our buildings during the school day? Again, a very high percentage, 53% says it's a very high priority. 31% said a medium priority. 13 low, two not a priority, and two unsure. And the last chart that I'm gonna share is the appearance chart. And the question, which I thought was very interesting, how much priority would it be to modernize the appearances of some of our older buildings so that they are visually appealing. Now, because I've heard from a number of people, and I'm not trying to generalize things, but when you drive by our facilities, they look good, but they're just not, you know, they're not that wow pizzazz or whatever that might be. Appearance. Uh, only 9% says it's a high priority to upgrade the outside of our facilities for appearance purposes. 39% say it's a medium priority, but 46% say it's a low priority. And 4% not a priority and 2 unsure. Tal, um, does, yes. does this really mean the outside of the buildings? Or does it mean, I mean, if we have somebody coming to move here, does the appearance include the inside? Because yeah, It says to modernize the appearance of some of the older buildings. So um, I'm assuming that this was an exterior kind of the drive-by question. I mean, okay. the way I took it, the way I read it. But what I also take it as is that if you go back to those last couple other questions about education, and again, maybe it's because I'm an educator, but people have a high priority on what goes on inside those buildings and the learning spaces inside those buildings. And yes, it's nice to have a nice appealing structure, but does it, um, um, you know, to modernize the appearance of our older buildings so that they are visually appealing? I think that was an outside question. I could be wrong, though. Okay. Okay, we can't really try to interpret how other people might have interpreted that. Randy, you have a question? Yeah, just to clarify, these are all unaided and unprompted, Absolutely. correct? And so the fact that we had yeah. such a positive response from a representative cross-section of the community, I think is, it's significant. 
uh, like I said, because if there was no prompting, no aid, this was just based on their existing knowledge when they took the survey. Um, that's, like I said, I, I think that's pretty significant. Okay. Better than I, what I would expect that it, of their understanding of our situation. Okay, <clears throat> okay so I, I spent a little time on those questions because I'm actually quite fascinated with them myself. And uh, the board has had an opportunity to take a look at these, and, and, uh, um, but I wanted to put them in a graphic form so you could take a look at those. So some considerations for discussions, and I don't mean to lead your discussions or anything like that, but some of the things that I just kind of put in here that we thought about was some of the discussions could be, um, you know, do the cost of renovating the current facilities outweigh the cost of building new ones? Uh, another question, and then we can go back to these or any other questions or discussions you might have. Can the facilities be renovated to accommodate our 21st century instructional delivery practices and our modern technologies? Are the facilities properly sized for the population of today and the future? Now, the reason I say that is the facilities commission, the uh, construction commission, literally rated eight of our, well, actually, all of our elementaries as undersized. Uh, Mercer was close, I think, but many of them, in other words, capacity-wise, they're over capacity right now with what the students we have in them. Um, and uh, Turpin as well. Anderson has some space, and um, Nago, I believe, is right there. So, and then uh, moving on, another thing that the uh, question to maybe think about is um, are the buildings well lit, spacious, comfortable? I think that's all important. Um, will the facilities be operationally efficient? I think that's key. And does the environment impart a feeling of safety and well being? I think um, um, Julie kind of getting back to this, that environment, that interior, uh, an interior environment as well, you know. Um, is it appealing? Does it uh, for not just uh, our, our on, onlookers or visitors, but it's for our students and our staff? So I'll kind of leave it at that. I'll be uh, Rick, myself, Ray. We were all involved in those, Ray? One thing I wanted to add, I, meant, I apologize for not saying this before, is the OSCC numbers do not include adding square footage stands and buildings. So the renovation or the rebuild is for the same square footage as there right now. So if we have a building that we feel is half the road capacity or needs more space, it doesn't include ad does not include adding space. Well, they have indicated based on their numbers, right? Okay. But what they're saying is, is they're not forcing the hand of the district in terms of a master plan. The district may choose to add additional square footage, may choose to add other buildings, may choose to do a lot of things. What they're saying is that building <coughs> You know, they're, they're not making determination on that because that's the question that came up before. Uh, but it's it's basically taking the same square footage and looking at what it would cost to renovate that footprint or to build something new to the same square footage. And at least in the case of um, Maddox and well, Wilson will be built, but Maddox has to have space added if we're going to do something about the trailers. Right. So what they're saying is we could keep the trailers if we want them. <laughs> yeah, but they won't pay for them with OSCC. Nope. <laughs> Dr. Jackson, can you talk to us about what it means to qualify for the OFCC dollars? Right. Um, where we are on the list and Certainly. whether we'd want their money if they offered it to us? Um, there, there are a lot of different stipulations when it comes to OFCC dollars. Um, basically, let's start with the qualification. Uh, when the Ohio School Facilities Commission was put into existence many years ago, um, there, had a, there was this large pot of money. And so to determine who got tobacco settlement. tobacco settlement, exactly what it was. So the tobacco settlement uh, many years ago. So they determined who was at most need. And they did that on a number of, of uh, priorities, but basically it was the need of the district in regards to the ability to pay. And at that time, there were districts in our, in our state that the facilities were simply atrocious. So I'm not knocking that at all. So but anyway, so they listed all the 614 school districts at the time from one of the most neediest, was number one, all the way up through 614. We are ranked at 500 and Rick, help me out here, 80-ish? 580-ish, 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 580 
at the time and still today because it, ha it has changed by a point or two as the years go by because they reevaluate it every year, but we're still at that 585 need. Now going back, the monies that were made available on a percentage basis was made available to the school at a higher proportion, a higher percentage to a school district with the highest need. I give you a quick example. In Lyme, Ohio, uh, they were very low on the list. They were some of the first schools to have gotten some school, all of their schools totally replaced. Uh, the state gave them 90 cents on the dollar. So let's just take an example of a $100 million project. The taxpayers paid 10%, the state paid 90. That's a pretty good deal, okay? Ours is at 85% taxpayer to 15% state. So not still, okay, 15% versus 85, okay, that's something to consider. But then you look at some of the other um, points that, uh, that OFCC. What they shared with us, we would have to do to their exact specifications. So if they said that, for instance, we'll just take any building, take Air Elementary. If they say that Air was capacity was, Ray, was it 450-ish at Air, I believe, or something like that. We'll just use that as an example. And we currently have over 600 students in Air. So if we were to do anything in here, we would have to bring it up to those specifications or add space another third the size of the building. Actually, 379. 379. So we'd have to about double the size of that building. To qualify for their 15%. To qualify for the 15%. For the 15%. So it's those things that you have to take into consideration. Um, and the expedited program that we kind of explored here, that's what this is, is a new program that was put into existence a couple years ago that says go ahead and do what you want to do piece by piece if you want. Let's just say that we chose to do some renovations to our buildings and maybe rebuild a building or so or whatever whatever plan that we'd have. Um, they wouldn't give us any money but if we did it to their specifications and piecemealed it like one building this year and another building a couple years from now, we'd have to complete the entire process before we would qualify for their 15 percent. And then, and then the, it would only be there for us if there was still money in the fund at the time we completed At the one. time we completed everything. That's correct. So I kind of a quick down and dirty uh, in regards to FCC. Yeah, let's just, just clarify. To get that 15 percent, it's not just square feet. There are other things that they might require that we might not, we might choose not to do. So the bottom line is it would cost us more than the 15 percent likely than it would to get their 15 well, percent. Remember, remember the other things that aren't included in it that, that we right. talked about. So the cost would be more. So we would have to be all in and we could cash in our 15 percent whenever our number came up in the ranking. Do, and, and they were very upfront. They said that's assuming that money's still there and there's no guarantee of that. School districts that are similar to us High, higher achieving school districts, um, suburban school districts. Um, one I can think of that uh, is working on facilities now is Marymont. Are they building to OFCC standards? Do you know? I, I couldn't answer that question specifically. I mean, I've been in the new elementary. Mm -hmm. I would have, my guess is, having walked through that building, probably so, but that's just a guess from what I don't know. I mean, I, I, I'm hearing all sort of negative things about going with the OFCC um, recommendations, but I'm not hearing anything positive at all. Do, do people do OFCC? I don't, I don't think that's, at least that's not the way I look at it. What I look at it is the work we got from OFCC, that big old binder that's sitting on front of Dr. Jackson, that's hugely valuable information, and we may want to adopt the the recommendations they've made, but we could probably do more for the community and make more with the more improvements with the dollars that we have ourselves if we didn't take their 15 percent. I don't know that that means we're we're not taking their information because I still think 
that's great information and what we've learned about our buildings is invaluable. If we didn't take advantage of it, we would be foolish. Well, we're talking about two different things here. One is what we do and then what we're talking about now is how we pay for it and whether we get any money from them or not. I don't think the fact that their funding system may not favor us, that doesn't have any impact to me on all the data and, and the recommendations and and everything else they provided. That's, yeah, that's two different that's right. things. I think it's not negative. OSFC has been phenomenal for many, many school districts across the state. It's I just that when districts get, when you're higher up on the, the, the priorities list in regards to the, you know, like us at 580s, um, it, it just sometimes, I believe, might be more costly for us. Yeah, I didn't mean to, to imply no, that what no. they did was valuable. I mean, we've been eager to get this data for a long time. I, I guess if we went all in with them, it's a, it's a cost benefit thing. I mean, that's what I'm hearing. We get so little from them, we could do more maybe ourselves than by taking their money is what you're saying. Is that too simplistic? Well, particularly because we're still, I don't know where we are in the least list vis-a-vis -vis other schools in front of us. I don't know how many are still there. So the only way we're gonna get their money is the expedited program anyhow. And then, is that right? That's correct. So we're not going to get it until we're complete with all our work, and then it still may not be there. So what I do is we take the value of the information they've provided and see what we can do with the money that we've decided to um, put into the plan and see if the community, of course, will support that plan, right, just, too. Just a slight correction on that. We would, anything we would do, yes, would have to meet their criteria. Uh, we don't have to complete the whole process. It's when our number comes up, and, and, you know, when our, our number comes up, anything we've done, we can use to apply that credit. So we don't, we will not have, I think Milford's actually doing that now, is they've done some things under the ELP program, and now their numbers come up. And so they're using that credit towards paying for additional work that they're going to have done. Their percentage that supposedly got banked? Yeah, they're, they're, yeah they, they banked that. So they're, I don't know <coughs> what their percentage was. It's obviously greater than 15. Uh, but that's what they're going out for. They've gone out for here recently. So their commitment is anything that they're going to be doing has to be done towards that. But you don't have to complete the whole process. But you can't use the banked credit to pay for existing debt, correct? It would correct. have to be new construction. New construction, yeah. correct. correct. I, get, I guess, again, I wonder who sort of like us is, is, is doing it according to OFCC standards. I mean, Milford probably <clears throat> does get a higher percentage than we do, but I don't know if it's a significantly higher percentage and what, what, you know, why they decided to do it. I, I would like to hear from somebody who's done it, who's, you know, that's sort of like us. I can I know their business manager, I think Bob Farrell, one of the things they're doing is the credit they have is significant enough. I think they're using that credit to and Rick may know more than I to pay for it's enough to pay for one of the new elementaries. So they're able to get a new elementary now having used that, but yet I don't know you know, that difference would mean if they paid a premium on the others to get that. You said their number comes up came up. Do you know what number that was? I Milford, I can tell you in a minute here. Yeah. One of the things, Julie, that, that I talked to an architect, and they were saying one of the things with the OFCC, one of the cost problems is that they, he said, micromanage what you do and how you build. And his example, and I don't know any of the particulars, but is a certain type of yellow pine has to be used. Not the, pine, not the yellow pine that 90% of the construction community uses, it's a special type, which is a premium. And he said those are the things that add up just in the, the nuts and bolts of putting it together that make most districts who are getting in that 15 to 20% shy away from it because that those are where the cost overruns come right off the bat. And, and I think if you look back at to the districts on the other end of the list, um, those are districts that once they build these buildings, they're going to have very few dollars to maintain them. So, so they are going to use the best quality of whatever because that might have a longer life or something to it. I'm not saying that we wouldn't, but at the same time, it does add additional cost. Milford's in the mid four, more 400, 460. They completed an ELP project and 
they're in the middle of the CFAB project. Um, and so another hundred schools and we're there, right? Yeah, I don't, I don't, I, I, I thought in one of the reports that we were given that we were told, and I may be, may be mistaken about this, where did the number 516 come from? That, that is a new number, the five. Okay, the, the so it's not 585. That. That was, oh, I'm sorry. That was it's 516. Number, I believe. Okay. It's a three-year average that's, that's adjusted, and that's a three-year valuation number. Average valuation determines that number. That's what happens when you go off the top of your head. Oh, that's okay. As, um, as Jim said to me, it's really probably yeah. not that significant anyway. <laughs> Ray, I was... Uh, at the new school board member workshop, and they were talking about this. And Ma Mason, I think, did everything the OFCC asked. I think Westchester did not. So, uh, place to start, maybe. Mm -hmm. Lakota's built some things recently. Yeah, I've seen, I've gone, I've gone on tours of something, Reynoldsburg built a new high school and I had the opportunity mm -hmm. to go through that and to kind of see some of the differences. I think the classic examples when they talk about square footage. And, we talked to Paul Brown and, and Raul. They said the organization realizes some of the criticism of that. So they've given the schools some flexibility, but I think when they met with Dallas and Rick and I, they still said they're still pretty much sticking to that formula of so many square feet per, per student. But the bottom line from all this conversation and similar conversations we've had in the past is we have little reason to believe or hope that we're going to get funding from OFCC anywhere in the near future uh, or that would have any or much value to Forest Hills. So my walk away from this is uh, we need to be self-sufficient on whatever funding we're thinking about for whatever facility projects we have. Well, I would assume we're going to be self-sufficient, but I wouldn't forego the, the possibility that we might take advantage of their money. I mean, as we go through this process and start to develop a plan, we're going to have to wait what they'd require us to do against the 15% because in the expedited program we do have a better likelihood of, of getting some of that money. Oh, if it's an opportunity, especially if we would earn the credit going down the road, sure. I mean, of course we're not going to turn it down. Right. I agree, shoot for self-sufficient, but I wouldn't ignore the Rick, possibility. What do you, Rick, what do you, what's your take on this? You're shaking your head. I want to hear what you No, I, 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 I think we initially, um, as we did in 04, we went into this with gaining information. I mean, that was uh, very costly uh, services for free um, to update kind of where we are with facilities and um, did not expect, you know, uh, it to get a lot better and it didn't. I mean, it, it, it you know, affirmed, you know, what we believed in 04 um, that, you know, building systems obviously need to be replaced and, um, you know, high level, you know, more of a call to action to do something. You know, we have, you know, nine buildings and, um, you know, eight of them in um, a aging state of repair. So I think that was the um, kind of what we went into it. And I think I, I kind of agree with some of the discussion at the end here is that I think, you know, there's some opportunities for to look at funding. Um, these are, I mean, if you look at their, their website, it's color coded, but, but every district, um, I should say most districts, only the white ones here <laughs> have done nothing. Most districts are doing something um, related to uh, their program, um, even if it's just what we did so far, and that is get a, um, the demographic and, and assessment, uh, building assessment. So, um, you know, I think we're still um, able to do all of this. Um, and, you know, they, they are educational specialists, and obviously we need to look and see um, what funding opportunities we have, but we can. Um, I also would agree that based on where we are, uh, we might be splitting nickels when it comes to, to actually getting some funding. Um, but um, to, I don't think that should get in the way of what we're doing, you know, moving forward. I, okay. So we're going to be meeting again Saturday, February 8th, 8 o'clock. Everybody's welcome uh, with a further work session and we're going to talk about some of these considerations <laughs> Dr. Jackson put up on, skip over and on the board and, and probably a process for moving this thing forward. Um, in maybe the last 10 minutes we've got here, um, entertain anything else that is on anyone else's mind, but if maybe the last thing Dr. Jackson you can do for us is talk about timing considerations for 
when we would have to go out with something. Okay. Any other questions or concerns? Can I just confirm sure. one thing that you said? Just a, it was a question that came up. The survey research data was gathered through telephone interviews. Uh, that spe uh, specially trained interviews conducted with 300 randomly selected registered voters of the Fort Hills local school districts who had valid residential or cellular telephone numbers. The interviews were performed during the period December 9th through December 12th, um, 2013. The overall estimated margin of sampling error was plus or minus 5.65% based on a confidence level of 95%, although it varies for each individual question. This means that if the survey was presented 95 times out of 100, the results would be within plus or minus 5.65% of the information provided. So I just thought I'd just clarify the the, um, the database. That was a question that we asked earlier. Okay. Um, if, uh, if then, Jim, I've got the same card you do, and I didn't write the information down, but primarily, uh, if the board, if uh, we're looking at being on the ballot, and let's say some of the, maybe an upcoming election, um, let's uh, take the next November election. If the board were going to be on the ballot on November the, uh, the 4th of 2014, then everything would have to be completed by the first week of August. And so then you work backwards. And so primarily there's two different resolutions that have to be um, voted upon positively. And uh, so really everything would have, and usually that takes about a month. Um, we could have a special work session and those types of things, but so um, a little over a month. And then so I guess the question would be if, the ba if we were going to be on the ballot in November that the board would have to have a plan in place, discuss that plan, uh, look at the dollar figures to go with that plan. Uh, we would get the resolutions to the board probably in July so that then the board early July, if not like June, so that then the board could have the month of July to, um, to uh, do the resolutions by, be completed by the first week of August. All right, so I've got the same card right. that you've got, but I don't understand it. The first thing we have to do is what's called a resolution of necessity, is that right? That's correct. Mm -hmm. Is that what has to be done by August 6th or? No, it has to be complete. Everything has to be completed by so August 6th. So the last thing we do is the resolution to proceed. That has to be done by August, August 6th. August 6th and filed with the um, Department of Taxation. Department of Taxation. So you got to back up at back least up. two months before. I'd that. say at least a month plus. I mean, you can five, six weeks. So that's why I'm saying July. July 7th is the. There's a, there's a systems issue, Rick. Once you uh, file the uh, resolution of necessity, there's some calculations that have to take place, like right? We get the millage then back from That's the, the county auditor. Lead time. And then, then you present, can go. Then you know what that millage is. Uh, uh, since you mentioned, uh, you know, you work two different ways with, with, a, with a bond issue versus an operating levy. A bond issue is you have determined through the analysis and community engagement that we need X dollars. What does that t translate into millage? That's what we will ask the county auditor to determine, and that will be part of what's on the ballot um, for a bond issue. Um, for a, um, a, a PI or an operating levy, it would be a millage amount. How much will that generate per year? That's the other side. Okay. So, so if you were to do something combined, you'd do it two different ones, or? Um, they have to actually they have to be together. We would um, I think the resolutions would have to be clear because the language that the board would 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 um, approve would have to be what is eventually on the ballot. So I think they would be combined at the end there. Anyone anything else before we move on? Move on. Well, then the, the next if the if the, the next general election would be May of 2015, and it would be the same thing several weeks prior to, um, in this case, if you look back, it says May of 14, so you just kind of um, would, everything would have to be completed probably by that first week of February. Right. Of 2015. Okay. And the Obviously, um, August is a special and November is a general election, obviously, uh, for, for, for those that need to know that part of it as well. Thank you.
Well, that was fun. <laughs> um, we have a motion to approve the minutes from the policy meeting of December 3rd. So moved. Second. Mr. Tapfer? Dr. Heiss? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Bissinger? Yes. Mr. Hemelgarn? Yes. Mr. Fruman? Yes. And next, approval of the minutes for the regular meeting on December 16th of 2013. Okay, so, motion. so moved. Second. Mr. Smith? Mr. Yes. Dr. Heiss? Yes. Mrs. Bissinger? Yes. Mr. Hemelgarn? Yes. Mr. Fruman? Yes. Uh, correspondence for, to the Board of Education, the Treasurer Superintendent, Dr. Jackson. I have uh, three pieces of correspondence I'd like to share with the, uh, the Board. The um, first piece of correspondence comes from Senator Shannon Jones. Uh, we received this uh, just a week or so ago, and it says, uh, Congratulations on receiving the Auditor of State Award from the State Auditor David Yost. As your State Senator, I proudly recognize this outstanding achievement. Uh, I applaud the integrity and utmost accountability for which Forest Hills Local School District has operated many, for many years. Your flawless, flawless bookkeeping is a testament of your reliability to those of your community. So a, a commendation or actually a congratulations regarding our most recent um, Auditor of State um, of, of um, having a clean audit. So congratulations to Rick and his staff and to our district and to the board. And for how many years in a row is that? No, we take them one, one at a time. So one. One. <laughs> one at a time. Well, well, two, two of the people that have been doing it, at least one of them is retiring, right? And what they say is, we love coming here. So that's a real compliment. Wow. And they also make it clear that while this has become the norm for us, and some of us may seem to take it for granted, but we don't. Uh, we would appreciate and recognize what a fantastic job you and your staff do. That's well, and to Dallas's point, everybody jumps in. I think it's a, um, we kind of keep score in our area, so we have to be that part of the game. But um, it's a something we, we take very seriously. And we, I appreciate the board's, um, you know, every year we strive for educational excellence, and, and the board um, puts that same emphasis in our financial reporting cost management and the, all the other things that go with that. And um, I know our taxpayers appreciate that and my office truly does as well. I can, uh, I can say having been on the administrative side for a long time, uh, Rick's office strives for a perfect audit, not just a good audit. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot that we have to do um, every day that's over and above that makes a huge difference when the auditors come in. So thanks, Rick. That last he really year. means that, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> or meant that. Last year, the uh, auditor Yost came down and personally gave Rick the, the award. So uh, that, that says a lot. Okay. Another piece. Uh, I'm really excited because I just received this one today. Um, this is actually going from our uh, state to uh, the federal government. So uh, this comes from the United States Department of Education, and it says, on behalf of the White House Commission on Presidential Scholars and the United States Department of Education. It's our pleasure to congratulate you because a student from your district of Forest Hills has been selected as a candidate for the United States Presidential Scholars Program. And that particular student, we remember recognizing her just last month, that received a perfect ACT score. Uh, so with that, uh, again, uh, Rebecca Tian um, has been honored. She gets to apply now. She's one of only 3,000 kids across the country. Uh, that had this recognition, and she may be uh, one of 140 that actually gets to visit Washington, D.C., so I'm really pleased for, for her in particular and her family, but also uh, thanks to uh, the, uh, the letter from the U.S. Department of Education. And then another piece of information that I received just today as well, kind of on another note, something we're going to be talking about here a little later on in the meeting is in regards to Calamity Days. Uh, Governor Kasich this morning said, uh, uh, stated in a press, um, to the press, that uh, he would like to uh, our legislature to explore additional calamity days. As everyone knows, it, uh, it's been a pretty rough winter across the state. Um, so he, Kasich is asking our lawmakers to pass a one-time increase due to the severe winter. But whether that comes to fruition or not, um, it's beside, but it's something that is definitely on our uh, governor's mind as well. 
and then we're going to talk a little bit about a possible option that we might be able to use as well. So They're talking about two days additional? Is that um, what he, I heard? There is no date, yes. He hasn't That's what I heard on the radio, yeah. yeah. On radio, yeah. too. Yeah, right. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Taft? No. Uh, procedure for public commentary. As many of you know, this is not a public meeting, but is a meeting held in public. Um, if anyone wants to speak at the appropriate time, the board will recognize you. Fill out a green card. They're up front here by the door. I've got one now, but I, I saw a lot of people coming in. I suspect there's some more up there, so no, not yet. If you want to speak, um, please get your green cards up there so we can recognize you at the appropriate time. Uh, next, we have a concussion presentation. Yes, uh, Dr. Jackson. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Freeman. I am extreme honor to present um, a Dr. Stephen Fagans and, uh, and uh, Lisa Sweeterman. Dr. Fagans is the Vice President of Medical Affairs of uh, Mercy Hospital Anderson and Lisa Sweeterman is Wellington uh, Orthopedic and Sports Medicine Director of Community Outreach. I think you still have that title? Yes. Okay. Uh, I just want to say first of all uh, Mercy and Wellington are phenomenal partners with the school district. Uh, I work with these people quite often. We have collaborative meetings together with what we can do to help improve our education. Both Wellington and Mercy have really stepped up in regards to what they offer in our students at the high school level in particular with their internships and their shadowing programs um, and what they do with our kids in regards to especially athletics uh, in regards to concussions. And when we start talking about this actually last year with just the impact testing. This is so much larger than impact testing, and that's what Dr. Fagans and Lisa want to share with you this evening for just a few minutes, so thank you. Well, great, thanks so much. After hearing about the students, I'm not sure I would be able to oh. actually graduate from this district, but um, I've been, I'm Steve Fagans, I'm internal medicine and sports medicine. Uh, Lisa Swederman is an athletic trainer as well as a, a number of other things, and I've dealt with concussions since I was an Air Force doctor, dealing with uh, tra mild traumatic brain injury of, of all types. Um, 10 years at Wittenberg and, and now, you know, here with this district. And so concussion is something that, you know, not that long ago when we sat on the sideline and we'd see somebody kind of get dinged and sort of like go to the wrong huddle or um, kind of act strange, we'd laugh about that. Um, not that much long ago, we would actually laugh at people when they would kind of get drunk and sort of waddle around and get in a car and drive. We don't laugh about that anymore. We don't laugh about getting a car drunk and we don't laugh about um, getting dinged on the head and, and being a little bit confused. And so we want to tell you a little bit about what we know to date about um, concussions, mild traumatic brain injury, what we do about that, uh, and where the, the athletes, uh, the student athletes of this district, I think, are well positioned to, um, to find those things and to deal with them. How do you think it's She's got it. Oh, okay. just have to point. <laughs> okay. So, um, some concussions are um, easy to diagnose. That's that's me at Wittenberg, and we're just about ready to, to call in the uh, the helicopter to come in to when when there's loss of consciousness. Go ahead. Um, this is uh, uh, Jermichael Finley when playing the Bengals, and has the classic comes up, goes down, has the vertigo. Um, early loss of consciousness. Everybody in the stadium, I was actually there watching that, um, knew that he had a concussion. And in fact, you may know that, that uh, he came back to play three weeks later. He had a second impact concussion um, and spent almost a week in the intensive care unit. Sports-related injuries, um, some number of 2.6 million actually hospitalized per year. Um, 300,000 of those are to the brain. 20% of high school, 40% of college football players or helmeted uh, football players get a head, head injury at some point in their career. And, um, and in fact, head and neck injuries are responsible for the great majority of deaths in sports. Uh, football is the most common. This is hard to see, but if you see, this is number of concussions per thousand student athlete exposure. Down at the very bottom is football. There's men's lacrosse, women's and men's hockey. So the helmeted sports are those that have the highest incident of concussions that we know um, in, in either practice or sport. Go ahead. We've moved as far as we can with helmet technology. Um, padding around the head helps to eliminate or reduce a fracture of the skull, but doesn't eliminate or reduce the actual movement in inside the skull. So what we want to do, uh, what we need now to do is actually to um, cushion the inside of the skull. And so what a traumatic brain injury is or a mild con or, or concussion is, is actually that 
linear acceleration deceleration where the brain goes forward, comes back, and is injured at that point. We used to call it like a brain bruise or something. We know now that it's more of a metabolic <coughs> injury. And so it can either be a linear force or a rotational force. And the rotational forces are those that cause actually more uh, metabolic damage. And we used to think that getting hit to the side, um, you know, it was the temporal load that was being affected. In fact, what it is, it's the rotational force that's causing more of the metabolic damage. Click on that, it should, it should move. So here's what we're talking about. It's not the, what's outside the skull, it's what's inside the skull either from the front or the side. And so we start to think about athletes, younger athletes with uh, less neck muscles, that whiplash injury. You don't even have to get on the, hit on the head to get a concussion. You can get hit in the body and have that whiplash injury and cause a concussion. That's simulating uh, the metabolic um, type of disturbance that occurs. So um, what confuses us and probably confuses you is there are all these guidelines. There are over 20, 22 different guidelines based on basically clinical experience, not necessarily evidence that guided us. We had various grading systems, various return to play decisions. Um, you may have been told at one time that you should wake up someone every hour to make sure they're, I guess, still alive or you know something. Um, and we know much more than that. In fact, the, the number three, Cantu, Dr. Robert Cantu, uh, the American College of Sports Medicine guidelines, that's the guidelines that that we always use. And Dr. Cantu um, is the medical director for the Boston University, the Brain Bank that you may hear about, where the NFL players and actually some younger players, those brains are, are studied there. Um, and where Dr. Cantu is actually the, the physician who came up with the chronic traumatic encephalopathy, the CTE, that which NFL players um, have been diagnosed with. So impact, neuropsychiatric testing. Four Stills District has started uh, been testing this as baseline since 2010. It's like any kind of vital sign or any kind of abnormal lab result. You know, Dr. Heiss can tell you that if somebody comes in and it's kind of not normal, what's well, the first thing you ask? Well, what did it used to be? What, what do you compare it to? If someone's at the 50th percentile, did they start at the 100th or did they start at the 30th percentile? Um, and so getting a baseline for this impact testing is necessary but not sufficient. Lisa. So what your athletes are doing, we mostly test your collision and um, uh, contact sport athletes. So what your athletes are doing is this neurological testing. So we put them in a quiet room. Well, there are 20 other kids in there, so we try to make it as quiet as possible. But we use your libraries, we put them in the room, and um, they do their own test. And it's about 20, 25 minute test. And it looks at all kinds of different things. Reaction time. Um, uh, composite testing, it looks at speed, so for example, the word red will come up on the screen. If that word is written in red, that's a yes. If it's written in green, that's a no. How quickly can the child process that information? Uh, that gives us the baseline. So we do these tests starting at 11 years old every two years throughout their entire career. And that allows the test to grow with the child as their child's development grows as well then that's our baseline. That's ideally we take that test when they're healthy. Then as we become concussed or ever we have an injury, like Dr. Fagan said, we have what their normal is. We have their baseline, which then allows us to go back. We test them after the concussion, and then we can compare those two tests and it gives us a better idea of how they're progressing through their concussion. But it's only a piece. Right, so the impact, so back up just a second. So um, the, the, the reason we know much more is because you want to do this sort of perfect neuropsychiatric testing that, that happens the exact same way every time, um, that measures seconds you know, to the microsecond of, of response time. That's what a computer is perfect for. And so this computerized testing helped us to really standardize in the mid-1990s from the University of Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. We're now on impact three. Um, and this is the same test that you know, a professional athlete a high school athlete, an NCAA athlete, you know, almost all collision sport athletes uh, get tested on now. This is to give you an example. So this is just the Cantu guidelines of the way we would grade a concussion. It would be based on loss of consciousness. This is one of those 22 different guidelines. And, and it comes, turns out that 
Um, you might have a, a player who has no loss of consciousness, but doesn't return to full cognitive function for months. You may have a player that has a full loss of consciousness and may refer, return to cognitive function you know, in three days. So the point being is that these grading scales based on just clinical experience really didn't give us prognosis. And so we have really simplified the diagnosis of concussion a lot. Basically, yes or no. You either have a concussion or you don't. And one of the key things that we learned is that we cannot make that decision on the sideline. Um, for a suspected concussion, we need, really need to make that decision the next day. And so, if you look at the Ohio High School Athletic Sports uh, Medicine website, you know, the very first thing, you can't see it there, is concussion. Um, concussion everywhere, concussion there, keep going. And so, Ohio was the 39th state to enact a concussion law which we actually very much support. This really, this really um, basically puts into law what we do, which is um, anyone since April of last year, uh, an official or a coach or part of the medical team, any one of those three can suspect a concussion. It's a hit or suspected concussion. That player is removed and does not return that same day. Um, we've seen plenty of players that look, look like a concussion the next day. On examination, turns out not to be a concussion. That player can come back to play. Um, seen folks that I don't think they had a concussion, but we'll see the next day it's very clear based on impact and other testing um, that they did in fact have a concussion and so we need to go down the cognitive rest as opposed to return to play. And so no athlete in the state, in fact 49 states now have this law, Mississippi being the only one that doesn't, uh, has almost an identical law in, uh, for return to play. And understand it's not just for the state of Ohio high school athletics. It is for all athletes that play all sports in the state of Ohio. The OHSAA adopted the state of Ohio's rule on that. So it's anybody playing in a peewee league, it's anybody playing in any type of sport that's sanctioned by anybody, that they have to abide by that Ohio law. And that return to pay play clearance can only be done by a physician. Now we can, actually school boards can actually delegate um, that authority, but we, it's a physician to us. Yes, and that question. Yes, do, doesn't that put a lot of um, stress pressure on coaches and parent coaches? I mean, if you're saying it applies in, to little kids too, then the parent coach has to make that determination. I mean, have we had any problems with that that you know of? In fact, it's quite the opposite. We found because then it takes it out of your hands. Mm -hmm. It really then you don't have to make the decision. Can they go back to play? Are they healthy enough to? The decision's been taken out of your hands, and mm -hmm. oh. Okay, we see a sign or symptom, mm -hmm. which your coaches will be educated on because most of them will take some type of class that educates them on what those signs and symptoms are. And then, so as soon as one of those is seen as part of the expression, a no-brainer, they're out. <laughs> um, <laughs> now, where, where we do run into trouble is when the parents aren't educated themselves about the rule. Uh, I ran into an issue, we actually had to call the cops on a parents at a high school out in Bethel because the parents kept coming after the ref and I because we pulled their kid out of the JV football game. They didn't understand the rule. The child showing symptoms, we pulled them, no option to go back. So it really does, comes down to the education and the idea that anything is seen, they're done. Okay. All coaches, as part of the coaching permit, <coughs> all officials must do a one hour training on concussions. It's good for three years. Um, and it used to be that part of this law, the previous law was that an official or a coach could point it out and the sideline medical team could return that um, player to, to, to the game. Or even the opposing uh, team ref, uh, a trainer could <coughs> return that to the, to the game. We prefer this. We prefer just you're out, we don't have to discuss the issue. Um, the official, the coach, or the medical staff can all make that determination. Okay. But that's the form that you have to fill out. Um, a lot of people don't know that there is an official form. It's very easy to download from the from the website. Yep. Now, even parent administrators, any assistant coaches, everyone, you have to have a uh, you get a little concussion test that goes through mm -hmm. ad nauseum all the signs and symptoms of of what it is, and it's it's a big change because you know the parents are the ones. Although coaches are starting to get it more, that you know nothing's more nothing's that important that you know so you go through and you'll see it a lot more so I mean even in uh, you know, soccer games and everything like that you hit your head it's becoming more accepted it's actually I mean we see a lot of parents who are pretty upset at the time 
the student athlete is pulled on uh, the next day or the following day you see him in the office you explain some things about what can occur kind of what we're talking about here and, and you pretty much get it so well I, and as soon as parents see a change in their child's attitude or behavior the next day if they are concussed it kind of wakes them up a little bit They're like oh okay my kid's normally not that lethargic or you know that difficult or having that kind of memory <coughs> problem so but he's right, sometimes it does take a little cooling down. But what it does for us as well as the medical staff, it also prevents that coach from running up to us and trying to talk us into letting that athlete play. And the parents do the same, but the pressure comes mostly from the coaches and that, that game time decision. So, But I will tell you, I've been on the sideline of, of teams from this district and coaches have pointed out kids for us to look at. Um, it's a really collaborative, collaborative work. So the difference between high school and college, um, the younger you are, and so this neuropsychiatric computerized testing allowed us to learn some things. Mm -hmm. We used to think that the younger you are, the quicker you return back from a concussion. It's just the opposite. The younger you are, the more plastic the brain is. It's still forming. It actually takes longer. Where a NCAA athlete may take a week, uh, a high school athlete would take two or most possibly three weeks to get back to that cognitive level. Um, not only is it return to play, but it's return to learn return to the class learning decision. Um, the treatment is cognitive rest. You get in a, a dark room. In fact, when we begin to exercise people, we exercise them on a bike in a, in a completely dark room. And so our first decision is actually the ability to return to the classroom. Um, I would have several uh, athletes at Wittenberg and, and, and that would be a big deal. They really couldn't take tests and things like that. Uh, we know more about that. Amnesia, not loss of consciousness, is actually the main indicator of severity and even mild concussions can have a significant effect. Um, we actually, if we do grade concussions in our head, it's the degree and type of what you don't remember. Do you remember what was going on right before you got hit or do you have an amnesia for just after that and that helps us with prognosis. This is the other part of that. So the impact test is a tremendous um, vital sign. It's like the blood pressure. It's, it's part of it but not the other. This is, I just showed you this form. This is called the acute concussion evaluation. It comes from the CDC. This is the other half of what we do. There's 22 symptoms. Um, we grade that. This is a part of not only return to play, but return to learn. Go ahead and go to the second. That's the other page of that. So this gives you an idea of when we you know, evaluate for concussion, it's, it's the impact test, is, uh, which is the neuropsychiatric, as well as that. Go ahead. So what happens? What is the concussion? I want to leave you with this. It's really a metabolic injury. No, there's no, there's no movement. They just like, that's a really cool, cool picture that we like. So it's, go ahead. It's actually at the neuron level. So what happens is um, when you get hit and you have a concussion, the neurons basically pour out potassium and, and take in calcium. And they have to use all their what's called ATP pumps to pump that out. It's like the bilge in a sinking boat. And so the whole cell has to work to write that imbalance. And the way you know, neurons work is like electricity. It's that um, electrical gradient. And so that could take a day, a week, a month to return that imbalance. Go ahead. Now, I put this in. This is from the resident lecture. But just to show you that, that that calcium, which is the longest thing to take, that's the time to heal the neuron. It's a metabolic injury. <coughs> not like a bruise, not part of the brain. It is basically most of the neurons that are having to pump that electrical gradient. Go ahead. And that's just an example of the chronic traumatic encephalopathy from the brain bank. And you see the dark areas of uh, some players who've had multiple um, hits over time and, and, and it actually, you could not, this, that could not be distinguished from Alzheimer's uh, plaques. So return to, to play. We just want to leave you with cognitive rest with a graded exertion um, until we have no symptoms. And then we actually use the impact as our kind of final vital sign. Yeah, so what we do at the end when the doctor says, okay, we're okay to start some activities, we return slowly. Uh, we start with the bike. We start with just the basics. Essentially, we want to work up to modeling what your child is going to be doing on the athletic field. So, but we do that in a controlled setting. And we do that to make sure that we don't get any return symptoms with just the basics. And then uh, we take our time with that. We make sure that they are asymptomatic. That is the big key. They must be able to do everything from schoolwork to athletics without any return to symptoms. Impact is good, all the doctors' tests are good, and they are asymptomatic through all the things that they are going to have to do on the athletic field. Once that has been proven, then we you know, look to return them to play on a gradual basis as well. We get them to practice a little bit before they're into a game.
So we really take our time and make sure that they really are ready to return when we say they are. So this is what impact is. It's the uh, immediate post concussion assessment cognitive. It's the neuro 20 minute, takes about 20 minutes. I will tell you that if, um, if a kid comes and he hasn't had seven hours of sleep, we have to redo the test. <coughs> and so sleep has a big impact on impact on the impact um, test. And that just goes to tell you that uh, the kids really do need to sleep more than they do actually. <laughs> this is the modules. It's, an, it's amazing to watch this. This is actually very hard to do. And it's actually had to change as we have more and more kids that have more and more experience with video games. Um, in that, you know, microsecond to a kid with a video game is like, you know, two minutes to me. And, and, so, um, and, and, and so that's one of the reasons why having the baseline um, to be able to compare to is, is so important. Go ahead. This is the, go ahead. Please. So this is the functional progression okay. we were talking about. Just going through those stages to make sure that that athlete is really ready to return. Uh, and each stage is different for each athlete. So if, well, that first stage might take one athlete a day. It might take another athlete three or four days. You know, we always say concussions are like faces. Everyone is different. And we're going to treat everyone as an individual. Uh, and so these are just basically what each of our athletic trainers has in their training room and what they use to return that athlete. Mm -hmm. So fine. In the, go ahead. Final one, and you may know that we, as part of the NFL uh, concussion settlement, you know, we, we received a grant, five thousand dollar grant, um, and we will use that to do baseline impact testing on every one of our athletes in 28 schools. Okay. Uh, that will also assist us in doing research, um, in uh, looking at because there's uh, so much more to, to learn, to, to understand and know. And uh, just to leave you with these points, we you do not return to play the same day. You don't. In the story. Um, cognitive and then physical rest initially and we use both the uh, acute concussion evaluation and the impact testing and so you may hear that you may like why uh, my, my computer test is okay but they're still doing things that's just part of it that's just the other part of it and then supervise um, exercise program and then return to play when it's the right time to return to play and so we you know our student athletes are students first athletes second they really are and, and it's really their cognitive ability to be in the classroom is, is even more important than their ability to um, play. So we really appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. That was very informative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And again, I just want to reiterate those two individuals in particular that do so much for our district, not only with our young athletes, but across the, the district. Uh, really appreciate having two people like that work with our district. Um, and great information and we were one of the first districts or at least we've been doing some of the impact testing in some of our buildings some teams since 2010 and most recently last year and this year it's close to 100 percent of our athletes now 100 percent of our athletes uh, parents can opt out i still believe can they not lisa parents can opt out, yeah. but uh, <laughs> very few do i don't know that anyone did honestly right good yeah. so um, very pleased okay you thank you thank you very much uh, 7.1, well, this seems a little silly, school board recognition. <laughs> um, the Ohio School Board Association is celebrating School Board Recognition Month this month of January of 2014 to build awareness and understanding of the vital function of our elected board officials uh, in our society. School Board Recognition Month honors our board members uh, in Ohio's 719 exempted city and local and joint vocational school districts uh, in the state. A Forest Hill School District is joining with the other districts throughout the state to recognize the importance contribution school board members make to their communities um, and to our school district. I just want to say that it's it's great having a uh, board of education like your like all of you. Um, I know, and maybe our community doesn't, but you all put in a lot of time into this, and it's uh, sometimes a thankless job. So I do have a certificate that I would like to first of all read Julie's, which is first, which just simply says, "In a sincere appreciation." for exemplary leadership and service to the public schools. Presented to Julie Bissinger, uh, Forest Hill School District, uh, School Board Recognition Month, January 2014. Julie. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim. I hope I got these in order for it. You like it. And, 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 and and uh, the, the little appreciation is a little fruit basket that our administrators got together and a couple of the little things. So again, thank you all for everything you do. Thank you. We all appreciate it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.
Uh, now is the time for public comments. I have one green card. Are there any more? All right, I've got three. Um, we'll do them in the order that they were given to me, and you're limited to five minutes. Uh, Mary Kay Carpenter. Thank you for fielding my question. <clears throat> As a mom of three young children in the district, I've been gathering my information in regards to your inner district transfer policy and reading, and I have a few questions for you. I've been busy gathering the facts from people in the district, from your main board office, from administrators and staff in my children's building. I am very well aware that there has been great work by Fallon Research, our faculty and staff and administrators in our buildings. I acknowledge that there are some issues regarding the Fallon Research such as fire safety and numbers in our buildings, regarding sa space limitations, and the concern for numbers for optimal learning. However, as I plan for the future with my children in selecting where to live in this district for high school, my question is in regards to the discrepancy of the 2013 performance index rating. For those of you who may not be as familiar, Turpin High School was ranked as number 28 out of thousands of high schools in our state. Anderson High School was ranked 174. My question is in regards to such a discrepancy and also looking at other public schools in our state that have multiple high schools or schools that have been a much closer, close, closely clustered number for that performance index, such as Cleveland and Columbus schools, where maybe one school might have been ranked in the 20s and another in the 30s. And I have gathered my information being educated that academics is similar in both locations for the high school. We've already heard from Fallon Research about the discrepancies with the structure of the buildings. I commend the teachers and staff for all their excellence in teaching, despite those building limitations. But I was hoping someone could address the discrepancy. Because as I do plan, I, as a taxpayer, would like the best academic environment for my students. And maybe one high school over another may be better for that individual student. And up until this point, I know you have to shore the streets that maybe are swing streets. I am aware of that. However, there has been that perception that people could potentially request or petition to go to one school over another. So as a parent, I'm hoping that you can help clarify that for me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Christy Blankenship. Hello. Uh, first of all, I'd just like to say you did a great job researching. I'm kind of taking a different stance. Um, I thought the board might appreciate kind of hearing from a mom who's had three daughters who had that choice. Um, and I have. So I've had, I've got three daughters. One graduated from Turpin. Our home school is Anderson. Uh, we moved to the district over 20 years ago. When we purchased our house 15 years ago, I wasn't even thinking about high school. I was thinking about changing diapers and keeping up. <laughs> so anyway, um, I'll tell you what the difference has been. And I looked at research, I looked at numbers. And when my daughter Bailey decided she wanted to go to Turpin, I was floored. I was coaching at Anderson. I was like, you've been at Anderson since you, Anderson since you were five years old. And um, it was really for her just the fit. It just fit better. And I hate to see, as a parent, this board take away that opportunity for future students. That's how I feel. Um, Nagel is a big school. I love Nagel. But you took three kids who are in this small, secure environment of an elementary school, and they only knew those 100 friends, and they knew them like they were best friends. And then you threw them all together in Nagel. It was huge. It's like this big fish pond. And they had to find friends again. And I remember when we looked at Anderson versus Turpin, you couldn't shadow at Turpin, 
but you could shadow an Anderson. And I took Bailey there. And um, she said, I just felt like I was home when I entered Turpin. She said, I got this feeling like I belonged. And for Nagel, she floundered in finding her friends again. And so when she remade friends, she, it wasn't about sports. It wasn't about um, necessarily academics for her. It was where she fit in. So I just really urge this board to give the kids what they need and that they can find the fit that's best for them. Because I will tell you, she flourished. And so our second daughter came along. She's chosen Turpin as well. It's been a great fit for her. Our third daughter, she's an eighth grader at Nagel. She's looked at Turpin. In fact, we spoke to Mrs. Johnson on Friday. I even told Mrs. Johnson two years ago, I said, if, if this board takes away that option, let me know because I'll put my house up for sale if that's what my kids want to do. So it's that important to me. So I just hope that this board recognizes that it's not just about the numbers. It's not about the team sports. It's not always about the academics. It's what's best for the kids. And I just think that we need to keep an open mind about that. So. Thank you. Joey Hazelbaker. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I should know. I spoke to your wife. <laughs> I didn't spell that right. I'm in bad shape. Uh, my topic is about the, I have a, a daughter that's at Nagel that would like to go to Turpin. I have a son who's in seventh grade. He's the same thing. My older children, I've talked to many of you about this. My older children attended Turpin. My younger children went there. They seemed, you know, they were there. They dreamed of going to Turpin. And now there's an issue with space at Turpin. And um, so I'm here to talk about, you know, the board doing something about that if they can to make space available or to change the policy so that my younger children can attend where they've grown up dreaming about going to that school. And so, you know, I've heard some ideas, some concepts that might fix the problem. And so I'm kind of here to just kind of make sure that comes up, talk about it. And, um, you know, and hopefully down the road the policy will work itself out so that other families that are choosing between Anderson and Turpin and the older kids go to that school, the younger children will be able to go as well. So um, really, kind of the, it's a very narrow issue, I think, and I just wanted to voice it. Thank, Thank you. Lot. All right, before I get somebody else's name pronounced wrong again, Dorothy, Dorothy, can you help me? Please? Dorothy O'Neill. O'Neill, thank you. I'm actually going to chime in too on the Turpin Anderson. I moved to the district in 2010. And we looked at properties both on Turpin and Anderson side. And our real estate agent said, oh, the nice thing with Forest Hills, the tax dollars follow the student. So I actually called the district office and said, how does it work? They said, you fill out a form, but there's no bus transportation. Now, I know this particular year is like kind of a mega class. They're large. So at the end of 2013, I called the district office and said, how does it work? How do I get the form? And they said, they're updating the form that I could stop by and pick it up at the end of June. So I did, dropped it off, and I said, what's the criteria? They said, well, when we received it, they said we look at academics, discipline issues, and tar er, attendance issues. So I thought this was good, turned in my form, and then the, re the forms got returned, and there's like a different criteria now. And I'm just trying to figure out what the criteria is now. Is it more subjective? Is it no longer based when it came in? Is it more based on what the board sees appropriate? and what? What is the criteria now? If it's not first come, first serve, kind of what is the criteria? So. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure we'll talk more about this when the, the intra-district policy comes up later in the agenda. Um, there will be some more discussion. Maybe we'll, hopefully, we'll be able to answer some of those questions that have been posed. Um, Next up on the agenda is updates from the superintendent, Dr. Jackson. Okay, give me just a second to get my update. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a couple updates for the Board of Education for our district. Um, 
we're in the process of um, uh, actually culminating of uh, this is a district publication that will be sent to all of our uh, resident households of the district and that publication is going to be a 16 page document to talk about our district and uh, inform our, our uh, constituents about the great things going on in Forest Hill Schools. Uh, that will go out in early February. So just an update there. Uh, another uh, update in regards to this Saturday is our, is our district science fair at Nagel and that starts at 9 a.m. and it goes to approximately 12. Um, and uh, it'll be lots and lots of kids and some great projects and it's really one of the thrills of uh, my year is going and just uh, the kids are amazing. <laughs> I have no idea what some of them are talking about there. Just, they're, they're really good and uh, the, the research that they do is phenomenal. Um, another piece of information uh, I've been sharing a little bit with the board and I'd like to uh, again give an update. Um, um, City of Cincinnati and uh, is the sister city to New Taipei City um, in Taiwan. And uh, over the past couple years, we have actually had an opportunity to meet the Taiwanese officials when they come to s and share with us all the great things about their city and and uh, what they are doing with Cincinnati and some of the different school districts, and uh, which we are a part of uh, the city of Cincinnati in regards to that process. And they have invited us to participate in a student exchange that a couple of the other districts have been doing so for a couple of years. And so we are in the process of uh, asking for some applications of some of our high school students uh, to possibly do a student exchange where they will actually go um, to uh, New Taipei City for about 14 days and experience with uh, um, the um, the families of the area, uh, attend school, learn a bit about their culture, um, I think it would be a great experience. Now what's unique about this is that uh, some of, and in fact a nice proportion of the cost of this for the students will be paid for by uh, New Taipei City government. So um, basically it's probably half if not more than half of the cost will be paid for for our students. So we're in the process of doing that, um, and uh, hopefully we'll get a few students. And we have we have several applications. Brad is back there. Um, uh, several, at least half a dozen. At least right now. half a dozen or more. And we just put the information out from both of our high schools. So I think it'll be a great experience. And then something else that uh, we've been working on for quite some time, and I think it's beginning to come to fruition, uh, is the we've been looking at it maybe expanding our um, our world language offerings or our foreign languages, as we call them. Um, probably one of the most um, sought after foreign languages in the United States uh, is Mandarin, Chinese. And, and it's also a, a language of which finding in qualified instructors to teach Mandarin Chinese is very difficult, mm -hmm. <laughs> as you can imagine. Um, we have uh, been put in contact with uh, a possible grant application and we have filled out that grant or we'll be submitting that yet this week in regards to um, a possible teacher exchange. We don't necessarily have to exchange our teachers, but we would be getting two certified licensed teachers to come and visit with us from up to one to three years. And again, what's unique about this grant, which takes place through the College Board, Ohio Department of Education, with assistance from the Chinese Educational Ministry, uh, they would be help supplementing some of the cost of doing this. So I think it would be a unique op opportunity for our students um, if we could uh, get this to come to fruition. And actually, it's a kind of a quick process. We should know within a, just a few week period, maybe a, by as early as next board meeting, that if we qualify for this particular uh, program. You say one to three years or we've asked for three if they do that right uh, the part of the grant is the sustainability of the program mm -hmm. and um, we, our thoughts would be uh, starting it at the middle school program and and high schools both high schools as well so we're, we're asking for two teachers so. great thank you did I do that right Brad yes. okay, thank you just double check well done <laughs> Brad's in charge of, he's done a, a great job in regards to working with these different officials in the grant process and, and, and uh, we've spent a lot of time talking about this. Yeah.
Thank you. Uh, next up, resolution adopting a calamity day alternative makeup plan. Dr. Jackson. Um, okay. Let me get my notes on this. Um, let me go back to the uh, to the screen here. Um, the um, again, because of the calamity situation that districts across the state of Ohio have found themselves in. Uh, as an example, um, this year, and it's the last year, by the way, that the state of Ohio is uh, actually offering calamity days or uh, allowing calamity days, and that's a total of five. And in this case, um, we have reached our five, as many districts have reached more than that. But um, also in our school calendar, the calamity days is we do have makeup days that we have scheduled. And primarily, there's a couple coming in the spring, and, and uh, but most likely would be at the end of the school year, just tacking days on to the end of the school year. Um, just a few days ago, it was announced that there was a program that uh, districts uh, who wanted to do something like this were to take advantage of this back in the summer. Um, where they ask you to prepare certain lessons that if you did get into calamity days and you wanted to at pasture five and you use these lessons well that didn't make a lot of sense um, to me uh, but with this particular new resolution that's brought back um, the state of ohio is allowing us to apply for up to three what's called online uh, instructional days uh, whereas what I think that this is a could be a possibly a great option or a good option for us to really consider that um, our staff would actually provide lessons for students for makeup that would be in uh, conjunction with what's currently going on in the classroom. If you think about rather than extending it to the end of the school year in June, um, you're just Yes, you could still extend what's going on in the classroom, but what might be going on in the classroom when all of our assessments and most of the meaty part of what we do happens in the spring. So uh, with that said, there's the, the resolution uh, that is before you. I'm asking the board to um, consider this resolution. Uh, if passed, we would again use this resolution. We would present it to the state of Ohio. We have um, um, the concurrence of our, uh, uh, our, our teacher organization that um, they would support this, and we would send that, and uh, we would then proceed on trying to make this a possibility of it occurring. Thank you. Do we have a motion? I move that we uh, adopt the Calamity Day Alternative Makeup Plan Resolution as shown in the agenda. Second. Discussion? So this, this does not necessarily mean we are going to institute it. It just gives us another just option. It gives us another option. Um, let's say that we have more than five calamity days we could maybe possibly use this for one or two of them or whatever we might have and do one of our other options for or it just gives us another option does it I mean the the statute says that we should have pushed the plan in by August 1st and I recognize why we didn't and I don't think we should have does the Ohio Department of Education have the ability to override the statute yes because the statute is uh is actually is, is part of the plan that they've authorized the state of ohio to, to do this in fact the resolution that you're adopting doesn't have any dates in that and we've had this approved by legal and this is the same resolution that the a similar resolution as ode has provided to uh, boards of education and other school districts and governor Kasich, if if his proposal is taken up in the legislature might provide some additional relief That's in correct. any event. Mm -hmm. All right, Mr. Tepper? Mrs. Bissinger? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Dr. Heiss? Yes. Mr. Hamelgarn? Yes. <coughs> Mr. Fruman? Yes. Um, board discussion. Anything on anyone's mind? <laughs> Um, I suspect we might talk about the intradistrict transfer of that. Um, anybody care to start? Do you, do you want us to wait until the, that comes up, or do you want us to do it now? It's it's coming up on the. It's actually under curriculum. It's for some under thirteen. It's not under board reports. You're right. It's under thirteen for some reason. Um, we can discuss it then after the motion. That's fine. Anything else? I just I have a question. Um, what happens if we exceed uh, calamity days, even with this plan? What's our next plan? Make up at, at the uh, end. Add at the end or at, anything earlier? Or? Uh, we have 
two days scheduled prior to the end of the year that we could use, um, and then we have days scheduled at the end of the year in June. I have those dates if you'd like to give up those dates. Great, thanks. Any other board discussion? I think it's usually Good Friday, President's Day. Thank you. All of spring break. <laughs> there was some issue with the April dates, though, wasn't there? Oh, I remember what it was. Yes, there was. The Calamity Day makeups that we would have available, um, that the board has approved, um, would be uh, February 17th. And on February the 17th um, is actually the um, President's Day holiday. So, and then the next day would be February, uh, excuse me, would be April the 18th. And April the 18th is um, a, a it's a spring holiday day, so and then we have uh, makeup days at the end of the year in June, June 5th, 6th, and on. So, yeah. July 4th. We'll be off July 4th. Yeah, we could maybe have July 4th off. Yeah. So those are the dates that, that we have options. Further board discussion. All right, next is the uh, Turpin High School quiz team overnight field trip. Uh, Ms. Ryan. I actually have three overnight trips. Uh, the first one, item 12.1, is the Turpin High School quiz team trip. Uh, in administ the administration at Turpin High School is requesting permission for 16 students, two chaperones, from their academic quiz team, travel to Medina, Ohio, February 21st and 22nd, and that's a Friday and a Saturday uh, of this uh, next month to compete in the Copley Academic Tournament. The cost is $30 for lodging, and the students will be responsible for their meals and utilizing district transportation for this event. Um, and I should add that there are also funds to assist with the cost for those students who um, have difficulty meeting that cost. The superintendent is recommending the board approve the overnight field trip by the Turpin High School uh, quiz team to Medina, Ohio, February 21st and 22nd, 2014. So moved. Second. Discussion. Mr. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Bissinger? Yes. Dr. Heiss? Yes. Mr. Hemelgarn? Yes. Mr. Fruman? Yes. <coughs> Item 12.2 is from Anderson High School. They are asking permission for 50 students and eight chaperones travel, their drama club travel to Columbus, Ohio, March 28th through the 30th, which is the beginning of our spring break, Friday through Sunday, 2014, to attend the 2014 Ohio State Thespian Conference. The cost for this trip is $125 per student. This includes the lodging, meals, and registration fees. The students will be utilizing district transportation also for this event. Superintendent is recommending the board approve the overnight field trip by Anderson High School Drama Club to Columbus, Ohio, March 28th through 30th, 2014. So moved. Second. I assume there's money to support. Schol uh, yes, there are scholarships actually for this event. Mr. Yeah. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Bissinger? Yes. Dr. Heiss? Yes. Mr. Hamelgarn? Yes. Mr. Fruman? Yes. Item 12.3 um, is another trip by Turpin High School. Um, their administration is requesting permission for 20 students and two chaperones uh, from Turpin uh, to go to the Ohio Junior Classical League to travel to Columbus, Ohio, March 7th through 9th, uh, 2014, uh, to compete at the Ohio Junior Classical League state competition. The cost per student is $185 for this trip. This includes lodging, meals, registration, and all of that activities. And we will be utilizing district transportation for this event as well. Um, the superintendent is recommending the board approve this trip uh, by the Turpin High School Junior Classical League to Columbus, uh, March 7th through 9th. And I should mention this is a Friday so it, through a Sunday also, where the students would not be missing school. Motion. So moved. Second. Mr. Tapper. Dr. Heiss? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Bissinger? Yes. Mr. Hamelgarn? Yes. Mr. Fruman? Yes. Thank you, Ms. Ryan. Uh, next, we have the board policy, second reading of the district transfer. Dr. Jackson? 
Uh, yes, uh, in front of the board is the uh, second reading or the adoption of the inter-district transfer. This particular policy uh, was, um, uh, has had uh, the policy committee review it and actually design it, help design that program. And that, uh, this policy, that's uh, Doc, or Randy Smith and Julie Bissinger set on that um, and uh, district officials, um, administrators. Uh, I would like to, if, um, would you like to do a motion first or would you like, I would like uh, Tammy Carnahan just to come and give a quick overview of the, of the policy itself. Randy? Oh, go ahead. Or you either of you? Well, what we thought we would do, we talked earlier today, um, maybe, should we do the motion first, do you think, or? Yeah, I think that procedurally the motion okay. should come first and then discussion. Um, and then Randy and I thought uh, that we would start off the discussion, sure. if that's okay. I, I think I, that'd be great. I know last, because it's a, it's a, pol it's a board committee, um, and I thought that, uh, we thought that uh, I would do a little bit of the background like I did last time, especially because there are so many folks interested in this policy. Um, and then Randy would complete, and then Tammy, that'd be great. great. For a team. And just to be clear, uh, the motion we're about to make is actually just the policy. Uh, we don't make the guidelines. Uh, that's separate, correct? Is, yeah. So uh, we'll be voting on the, uh, the intra-district intra transfer. And uh, I move that the board approve the intra-district transfer policy as presented. Second. Discussion. Okay. Um, <clears throat> for those of you who were here last time, forgive me because this is repetitive and it's, it's short, I promise. But we just wanted to give you a little bit of the history of, of how we got to where we are. Um, Forest Hills has been extremely liberal in permitting uh, transfer from one school to another. And, and actually there have been very few guidelines in the past in managing. Um, our policy was called the intra-district open enrollment policy. And it said the board shall permit any eligible student in the district to apply for enrollment in any district program or school provided the student's application meets the requirements of the state and the conditions established by district guidelines. Um, and the current restrictions primarily have to do with capacity issues in buildings or grade levels uh, if a student has a history of suspension or expulsions and, and a racial imbalance. And, and frankly, what happened is the numbers got away from us, um, resulting in um, certain schools or programs reaching or exceeding capacity. And the issue came to a head for us with the anticipation of next year's freshman class. It's a very large class. And uh, we decided that we needed to do something. So last spring, we began in earnest to look at what we should do. And um, I, I know initially Tammy and I had some sort of informal meetings and then Tammy, Dallas, Randy and I um, uh, began initial discussions. Um, we spoke with parents and administrators. Tammy gathered and reviewed policies from other districts. And then the policy committee itself took charge of the issue this fall. And um, for capacity purposes, it was, it was very, um, I guess, fortuitous that the OFCC report came out around the same time that we were earnestly discussing the policy. So what we did was we used the OFCC capacity numbers when we were talking about our policy. And <clears throat> under the um, OFCC capacity um, numbers, currently Turpin exceeds capacity um, and um, uh, so we used OFCC for the high schools and we used elementary class size or program uh, capacity um, for determining what, what, what that should be. Because it's more appropriate in the elementaries for um, uh, the self-contained uh, or the team classrooms. I hope that makes sense. Um, since some buildings in the district have little or no ability to accommodate inter-district transfers other than those that might be required for special needs or otherwise required by law, the policy committee, consisting of Superintendent Dallas Jackson, Treasurer Rick Tepfer, HR Director Tammy Carnahan, and board members Randy Smith and myself, uh, we met on November the 15th and uh, December the 3rd, and we recommended the policy that was um, presented for the first reading at the December 16th meeting. Now, one more thing I want to tell you, and then Randy's going to take over. Um, we also had uh, the proposed policy reviewed by everybody in central office for any input that they had. And um, since the last meeting, we've, uh, we've had some more discussions, and Randy will share those with you. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, recap that um, although the policy was called the open, uh, enrollment. Open, open enrollment, 
That was actually a misnomer. Uh, there really was not an open enrollment policy in the Forest Hill School District. I know I've heard from some realtors, they've made some interesting statements, uh, which probably helped move houses, but that actually was not accurate. Um, the policy uh, even then was, was very clear. Uh, there are district boundaries for each building, and that was stated in the policy. And uh, the transfer was dependent upon capacity. And as uh, Julie pointed out, uh, we're at the point now where uh, every building in the district, I, except maybe Anderson, uh, exceeds capacity uh, based on the OFCC numbers. And so we have to do something. We can't not do something. Um, clearly there has been confusion. What we were trying to do is work through this and minimize confusion. Also make it fair so people understood exactly what was the criteria and, and how is this, how, how should it work. I also want to point out that even though you've heard us just say that we're voting on the policy, what we have looked at and what uh, is the change which may be a solution for some people who are, uh, have a, a situation with um, siblings is, let me just read, uh, if it's okay, I'm going to read the change to the guidelines uh, for how the superintendent and the director of curriculum would evaluate the applications that would come in. Um, let's see, students who have been attending a building that is different than the one their residents run of their residents due to prior intra-district transfer approval, uh, li living on a pick or uh, swing street or special program placement, uh, or younger siblings of students described above who will be concurrently enrolled in the same building. However, and this is the key part, Students who are currently, and that means January of 2014, enrolled in 7th or 8th grade who have a sibling who previously graduated from a Forest Hills school, meaning Anderson or Turpin, will be grandfathered to the same high school from which their sibling graduated. That's key language because if you had a, uh, a student graduate from one of the high schools and they are currently in the 7th or 8th grade, they will then have the opportunity to attend uh, that that school. Um, Dallas, help me out with the rest of the criteria because it's it is still capacity is still an issue, um, but that is the exception that would be allowed uh, as the uh, applications are being reviewed. Correct. But there are, there is a in the guidelines itself. There's definitely a priority, but it comes down to basically capacity. And it was our intent, uh, first of all, the board didn't at any case, even in, when we talked in our <laughs> committee, did we want to say that there was a student that was attending, let's say, Turpin, and then we're going to say, say now the sibling is going to go to Anderson. Anderson. We wouldn't let that. So uh, there's some grandfathering, and that's what Randy was, was sharing. Um, to, to accommodate our current middle school students who has had a sibling who has attended one of the two high schools, either Turpin or Anderson. We will grandfather the current seventh and eighth grade students um, to that particular building if they so apply. Okay. Well, hold on, is that right or is the concurrent enrollment required? Uh, no, it says however the students currently, uh, the con Current enrollment does not apply for our current or the changes. That's what we talked about, Jim. Of a sibling. Here's an example. Let's say that I had a sibling, a, my brother, <laughs> graduated a year ago, and I am a seventh or an eighth grade student. Then the grandfathering would allow that seventh or eighth grade student, since their sibling had graduated from Turpin in this example would also be permitted to go to Turpin upon their uh, application. So that's the change, I mean, that, 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 that we had talked about. Um, seventh and eighth grade who, it's not a concurrent. Now, let's take another example just to go one step further. Let's say that um, we have a seventh grader who who is uh, fits this criteria and in two years they are in Turpin will say this example again. And then there's another sibling that comes along. You have more than one child. Um, and let's say that then that's when the concurrency would come in. Okay? 
So if that seventh grader is a freshman at Turpin uh, or sophomore, the next year and there's another one right behind them and then they would again we're not going to separate that family at that particular time in that building okay does that make sense okay um tammy is there anything you you might need to add to that as well do you want to talk about the priorities uh, yeah I just one second tammy um and, and I, I know there's at least one family that's interested in this in the audience um the seventh or eighth grader doesn't have to be in Forest Hills right now for that to apply. It can be the, the, the right, child, the child, the child could be like a GA or whatever. Um, right. Yeah. I apologize. Yes, because they would have had a sibling that graduated from one of the Forest right. Hills high schools, but they have to be a current seventh or eighth grader. But uh, Tammy, so a seventh or eighth grader uh, who has not had someone at a particular high school, they are by policy going to have to attend the school of their geographic location well they can make application and they can make application right right and and they also won't be grandfathered this is not a policy that is ending um intra-district transferring okay it is still alive and well uh with guidelines that's correct we've actually prioritized um some of those guidelines um and uh, if the board would like i'll just very quickly talk about those um, first priority would be given to a sip. Ms. Conahan, would you come up here so that sure. everybody here can hear you? Thank you. Uh-huh. First priority would be given to a sibling um, who is, again, concurrently enrolled. Um, and the second priority would be those who have a child care provider in a different attendance area. And obviously this is probably going to um, apply mostly to our elementary students, but we do have people who apply for interdistrict transfer because grandmother, you know, might live in Ayer and they live in Mercer or, you know, so forth. The third priority would be the uh, students of staff members who live in the district. So again, they have to still be Forest Hill students uh, live in the district and they want their children to attend the school in which they teach. So again, it has to be in the school they teach. And then anything after those priorities are satisfied, uh, we would be looking at uh, considering the rest of the interdistrict transfers um, as they come in, in the order that they're received. Based on the capacity of the building. Thank you, yes, based upon capacity. And I, I believe Julie said this, um, but you know, for our two high schools, we are looking um, very strictly at our school facilities uh, numbers. But for our elementaries, we're actually looking at class size because it's really difficult. You know, for anyone who knows anything about elementary, it's really hard to, to make that judgment on a building size. It really needs to be by class size. So we're trying to keep our class sizes at a reasonable number. Um, well, another thing that I would just say is, you know, just we, we have done some projections um, based upon the number of stu students that we know are currently attending school at Turpin and Anderson. Um, we've looked at our larger class coming in from Nagel. We've looked at the class that's graduating. Um, and we've also looked at those students who are, um, who we believe will probably want to be grandfathered in as a result of, you know, an older sibling. And Anderson would be at approximately 1,195 students um, next year. And again, these are projections, uh, which is about 85 less than what the capacity is there. Turpin, on the other hand, with all of those numbers, would be at 1,261, which is 81 above capacity. Um, so as you can see, you know, we really do have a capacity issue you know, there at Turpin. So. How, how often would this uh, be evaluated as far as the numbers? Would it always, are the OFCC numbers? Because we had talked earlier about the OFCC being a little more um, maybe maybe liberal with uh, building size and things like that. Is there? I, I guess I would defer that to the board because, you know, the actual policy itself would be a board decision. Um, you know, the guidelines would be what we as administrators um, put together and used to administer the policy so you know, I, I think two things one the OFCC is an objective measure 
It's, it's, nobody has any skin in the game. The OFCC is an objective measure. Plus, we've been hearing from our principals, we're, we, we're, we're full. We cannot take any more kids. Um, it affects education, it affects movement through the building, a, a myriad of things. So, um, yeah, The principle we used as we approached this were, you know, what's right for the district and, and student learning based on the capacity of the building, and also balance that with some unique situations for, uh, for families to try and figure out what's the compromise, how do, how do we make this uh, the, the optimum given the situation we're in. As I said earlier, uh, I think everybody is aware, we've got a enrollment bubble that's moving through and uh, to do nothing is not an option. And uh, that's one of the reasons we changed the name of the policy, or I should say corrected it, because there was a misnomer. I mean, if you hear open enrollment policy, you think that there is open enrollment and there actually never really was. It was just uh, mislabeled. And so that's why it's all kind of come to a head here and that's why we took the time to reevaluate reevaluate the policy, be very clear on what the criteria are, and make people, help people understand, uh, you know, here's, here's uh, what the opportunities are. Because I know I've, I've heard from parents uh, in years past some stress on their middle school child because they had to make the decision on which high school to go to, and I said, I didn't understand that because we, we have districts for each high school. Uh, the option is not there unless there's some unusual circumstances. So uh, hopefully by going through this process and reworking not only the policy but also the guidelines, it will clarify and help people understand here's what the situation is. Again, keeping in mind we've got to do the right thing for the district from an enrollment and a learning uh, standpoint. Randy and Julian Dow, just to, to one thing that underlying the whole process was is that we believe that both high schools have identical educational opportunities and that learning occurs at the highest of levels whether it's on Forest or on Bartles um, so I, and and I, I, I can't address the, the first speaker I mean I not to go into a lot of detail but the percentage points in PI between the two just the two our two high schools are very minimal that literally could be as many as one or two students uh, in regards to that uh, the, the, they, the, both of our high schools, as far as PI index, are some of the top in the state of the thousands of high schools that we have in the state. Um, and again, uh, equality of programs, phenomenal staff, great programs in both buildings. And I can, I can understand that your thoughts of, uh, of I mean, and I hear the, I hear, and I, I listen to the, the parents, but we do have two quality programs. It's not like we have a have and a half not. It's, it's we have two quality. Now, the people I spoke with and heard from, I think this change in the guidelines will is a solution for some of them. Some of them, maybe not all, but I, uh, the ones I spoke with. Well, I spoke to a lot. Some of them are here tonight. And some of them are. Uh, I got a lot of emails. Um, there were a lot of discussions, and at the end of the day I have to agree it's it's all about creating the best learning environment for all of our students throughout the district we're over capacity at some of the buildings doing nothing is not an option and this policy allows us to have the best learning environment for the kids in all of the buildings one thing I've asked the superintendent to do after we got through this process it's to send a letter to every realty office in anywhere near the Forest Hill School District so that they are very clear on what exactly what our policy is. But we'll get to that later. And speaking of that, um, for those of you who are in the audience, um, there will be a link on our website tomorrow with the uh, district policy, the administrative guidelines, which you know really is the administration of the policy, as well as the form. So just go to the district website and there will be a link, I think it should actually say inter-district or something, and you should be able to very easily find that. Um, so. I also make a suggestion, I, we talked about it last time, is we talked about district boundaries and what school, what built or houses go to what school. And I had a realtor ask me about the, the uh, new development going off of Clough, or for that matter, I mean, maybe down the line, the the Coldstream Megaplex that they're talking about. Is that is that available or, or maybe we could make that available as it stands now, obviously subject to to 
to district redistricting or, or what have you but we, we do not have an updated map at this point um, we are trying going to try to work with the township to get that um, but we would have a street guide that is on the district website and if you had any questions about where you lived, um, especially those people who used to live on or, or, or lived on what we used to call pick or swing streets, um, that information, you know, all of those will be available um, so people will know exactly what building that, you know, they're in, whether that's an elementary decision or, or a high school. Some of you may know this, many, some may not, but we're renting trailers at two buildings right now to deal with our overcapacity. So this is not an imagined uh, situation. I mean, it's, it's, we're, we're over capacity. <laughs> right. Certainly we couldn't allow a situation to occur that would have us running trailers at Turpin next year. Historically what happened was uh, when Nagel Middle School was built, I don't know if many people know, but all the 7th and 8th graders, 7th uh, and 8th graders on the Turpin side were all in Turpin's building. 7th and 8th graders for Anderson were all in Anderson's building. So you had those two classes of kids in those very same buildings. And uh, the school system, the transfer policy, inter-district transfer policy was a little more stringent because they could always use the overcrowded issue. And then Nagel opened up and now all of a sudden the overcrowded issue was gone. You couldn't use that as an issue anymore. So uh, I think that's why it became more lax and why people started calling it open enrollment unless things were challenged. Um, one of the positives I think is, uh, you know, society-wise we're going more towards choice in every different way. Uh, we have kids in all different school systems that live right here in Anderson Township. Um, we've got different restaurants to pick from and different uh, dry cleaners to go to and uh, different sports leagues to play in. And I think it's uh, choice makes people better. So it's great that we have two outstanding high schools in our district that we have to choose from. Um, having said all that though and listening to everybody and respecting the good work that the committee did, um, if you walk into some of these schools, it, it's we're, we've done the 360. We're back to where we're out of capacity. Um, things have grown and uh, some changes have been made and it's probably something we're going to have to do. I, I agree with Tony that um, I think Nagel, I think Nagel and everybody being in one building like that um, made it a lot more of an open enrollment uh, uh, kind of atti mental attitude with people. Um, you know, what school do I choose? Excuse me, before you go, is there a way to ask Um, it would seem to me that the time you discuss it is the time to ask the question, not 45 minutes before we discuss it. The answer is no. This isn't the forum in which to answer questions, and it's not that we don't care to answer your question. It's that this isn't a public meeting. If we begin taking questions from the audience, we won't be able to conduct the, the business of the school board. It is the reason why we give uh, people the opportunity to fill out the green cards and address us at the appropriate time in the meeting. Um, I, I really, it, it pains me to say, no, I don't want to hear your question, but it's not the appropriate form or time for a question. Can we ask for a clarification on the policy only because Mr. Smith had stated that everyone he, that the policy changes address everyone that he spoke with. And I spoke specifically with him about pick swing streets. I'm just concerned about... Let, let me address that without actually answering your question. Um, I know every member of this board cares very deeply about every student in this district. We, we are fortunate to have members of this board that care nothing about what's best for the community as opposed to some other districts that you know have people on there that, that frankly I think are looking more at uh, disassembling public education. That's not the case in this district and hopefully it never will be. We have all talked and I, I know we have all talked to lots of people. Uh, some of the people in this room and a lot of people that couldn't make it this evening. Um, I have had calls two, three, four, five every day for the last month since the last meeting and email after email and I know other members of this board have been equally called. So we, we've had lots of questions and we've taken them all very seriously and we have considered this and at least I know have, have stayed up night worrying about how is the decision that we're about to make going to affect this family 
and this family and that family. And at the end of the day, while your question is certainly important, the better question that we as the board have to address is what's best for the community and the district as a whole, not one particular family, although we care about each and every family in the district. Um, that's not a direct answer to your question, but it's how we got to where we are now. Any further discussion? Well, I'll say that my, to echo what was said here, and I, I got a lot of phone calls and, and emails, as, as I should and as we should. I mean, that's, that's our, why we're here. My concern is, is for the, the eighth graders who don't have siblings, who are six months away and uh, from, from going to high school. Um, and to a lesser extent, the seventh graders, and then I mean, it goes down. And, and a lot of the discussions I've had, the, the, the parents that I've talked to, I mean, they're, they're, they understand, I mean, the, the numbers the, are projections, but I, I'm assuming that they're relatively solid projections. And being plus 81, I mean, that's a whole wing. Of, of Turpin. Um, is, you know, I, I, and I guess I got the answer from where the priorities come. I, I would like to see an, a, another rung on the ladder. You have the, the priorities of the people. Personally, I think the, the open enrollment was, was not a well thought out plan originally. And we're having to, and we're, and we're paying the price for it now. So now we're, we're in a spot where, I mean, we've had it with some of the schools, we have, you know, we have, again, the wonderful trailers at two of our elementaries. And because we're overcrowded. And now we have a high school that's overcrowded. I mean, a lot of development's gone on north of Clough. And, uh, and, that's, and that's what we're seeing now. Is the potentially, and where it may not, and it may be just procedural, but to have another layer of eighth grade, seventh grade, and Swing Street as understanding that as we go through, at some point you reach capacity and you, you have to say no more, you can't do that. But is to have maybe a, a some priority for those who, as we transition to a firmer structure, uh, to have some priority, even if it turns out that you know, the, the buildings are full. Yeah, but as a practical matter, they are full. They're already over capacity and giving them priority. And a pro being first on the priority list may not be enough. Understood. And, and one other thing that I'd just like to say is, you know, if the board would not have taken this step, if they would have never looked at interdistrict policy, um, our current policy just says that um, once a building reaches capacity, you know, we can say no. Um, in the middle of August, this past summer, we actually said at Turpin, no, we're full. You know, and we stopped taking additional students. And, and you know, it was only a handful, people who had very late applications. So it, uh, you, I, with this, I think we're actually taking more students than we may have with the old policy, just simply because of the grandfathering in. I mean, if you just take out those students we're grandfathering, we're still at approximately 12.30 at Turpin. And when we started this discussion, we were already over capacity at mm -hmm. Turpin. Yes. Um, and I'm looking back on notes that were from a long time ago, um, back in November, so. Just, just for clarity on the pick or swing streets, if there's a sibling, they're covered under the guidelines. If there is not a sibling, they're not. That is correct. Um, the Pick Streets have always been an Anderson District Street. Always from day one. There was never really a choice between the two, but it was a always determined that those streets, if you look at any of our documentation, were Anderson go to were Anderson Streets. And, and part of the reason that happened, I think, although I don't think we, we, we look for the historical background, but I think for those of us who had kids at Sherwood, um, Sherwood is one of the only elementaries that really kind of splits Anderson and Turpin. Like, 
naturally. Um, you know, I, I live off Salem, and we're uh, we're we're a Pick Street because we went to Sherwood, um, I think. And uh, there's a whole cluster down there, um, but we are geographically Anderson. Does that make sense? And uh, you know, it's it's probably been about over the years, in in my experience, about fifty fifty. You know, fifty percent Turpin, fifty percent Anderson. Anyone else? Uh, I'm still out of part. My go ask the question that maybe it's not going to answer. <laughs> <laughs> it's you know, I filled out the form the district had. I met the criteria the district had at the time. Now it, it appears there's a special interest for me that's kind of I think the one gentleman mentioned people that have been he's kind of satisfied that people that he's got to know about the siblings, but no, no, that's other taxpayers mean. Why couldn't it be? Who filled it out first? Ma'am. Ma'am, yeah. it, it's not a public meeting. I, I apologize. I know, I we we card can't card we can't do this. We can't do it. Okay. Uh, you did fill out a card and you had your opportunity to speak. Uh, I apologize. I, I don't mean to be rude. We just have to control yeah. the meeting. Any further discussion? Mr. Tapper? Mr. Smith? Yes. Mrs. Bissinger? Yes. Dr. Heiss? Yes. Mr. Hamelgarn? Yes. Mr. Fruman. Yes. Human Resources Report. Ms. Conahan? I think I'll just stay up here then. Um, if you would please take a, a look at your Human Resources Report, Item A, uh, Retirement. Mike Bond, 35 years teaching in Forest Hill School District as a math teacher in Nagel. Uh, he will be he will be retiring at the end of this school year. So we'll, we'll see him again. Uh, item B, resignation of coaches. Item C, we have a leave of absence for the next school year. Salary schedule. And you, um, item D, you had already seen that salary schedule, but there was a minor tweak that we made, and I wanted to make sure that you uh, approved it as exhibited. Item F would be our appointments. And please note, these are probationary um, employees in probationary employment based upon our master contracts of both of our OPSI groups. <coughs> Item G, special service appointments, and you see a number of athletic events here, as well as um, some academics with some time work beyond the contract, as well as the addition of an instructional consultant who will be providing uh, some work for us in curriculum. Um, going on to page three. We have our destination imagination coordinators, and I might add that those are funded by the Forest Hills Foundation for Education, and you see those folks there. And the Anderson High School drama production. Item H, um, all of these are coaches or advisors uh, for our, our various buildings. Item I, substitute personnel. Item J, uh, this is removing substitute personnel from our uh, district. And please note that since our December meeting, we um, actually had one student who, uh, due to a new student, due to this, um, his attendance or her attendance, it increased our bus route 0.01. So our FTE is now 769.83. And the superintendent recommends that the board approve the HR report as reported. So moved. Second. Mr. Tepfer. Mrs. Bissinger? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Dr. Heiss? Yes. Mr. Hemmelgarn? Yes. Mr. Fruman? Yes. Business operations, Mr. Johnson? Payment in lieu of transportation? I was stunned to see so many people walked out and didn't want to hear this this item. But, uh, <laughs> uh, as as we do every year, we're bringing the payment in, in lieu of transportation resolution. We've had a, uh, received a an application from a new student who got in before the deadline, as well as instead of waiting till April, we were able to find that they, the state again has increased the amount, so we revised the amount as well. So the resolution. For payment uh, in lieu of transportation is attached. Tre the treasurer recommends the board adopt the payment in lieu of transportation resolution as presented. Motion. So moved. Second. I'm um, sorry, Tony. Mr. Tapper. Dr. Heiss. Yes. Mrs. Bissinger. Yes. Mr. Helmogarn. Yes. Mr. Smith. Yes. Mr. Fruman. Yes. Just to be clear, I like bringing this up because I found it interesting the first time I heard. We the 
payment lieu of transportation, everyone who goes to that school has to agree Correct. to to do that. And then and then the district does pay those families two hundred and fifty dollars per child. Correct. Per rate they attend that school just a portion of the year that's per rate based upon the amount of time they attend that school. I just like my neighbor was surprised. I try, he was trying to get all of his IHM friends to. Yeah, I think it's a lot of people don't realize that the public property tax goes for all students, regardless of whether in public or private schools. So a lot of people don't realize that some of our money, it's, it's not all going just for the public schools. So there, I, mean, I know you know that, but, uh, but I think a lot of people are surprised by the fact that and there's, there are other things where we're using our budget to cover all students in the district. Thank you. Um, treasurer's, re oh no, skip one. Annual membership dues to the Ohio School Boards Association, Mr. Tepfer. Yes, um, we're requesting to renew the annual membership uh, for the calendar uh, year 2014 with the Ohio School Boards Association. Uh, the membership fees have not changed since last year. That fee is $7,296. Um, this membership entitles to a lot of services that, that many of us, including the Board of Education, take advantage of, including legal assistance, labor relations, lots of different professional development, uh, school board services such as strategic planning, uh, workshops, um, a lot of comparative analysis throughout various um, operational areas that we want to compare ourselves to best practices. Um, they also vet a lot of vendors and have a, 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 a list of vendors that, that we know are tried and true and that actually are very school friendly to our business. Um, so we, um, we value this partnership um, I mean, there's in fact entire services catalog, but since 1955, I think we've been um, members since the beginning, and so we recommended the board approve the renewal of the man annual membership, of the Ohio School Board Association, um, for the amount of 7,296. Motion. So moved. Second. Mr. Tapper. I, 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 discussion. Yeah. Uh, I have to abstain because I am a, uh, a trustee for the Ohio School Board Association, so legally I'm not allowed to vote on this, but I want to make it clear I'm very supportive. I also want to point out that uh, by uh, taking advantage of some of the benefits of uh, being a member of that organization, it's a net savings for the district. I mean, there's also things like the discount we get on board docs. Um, I'm not sure about the, um, uh, what's the... Uh, Workers' comp. Workers' comp. Yeah. There are a number so of things. So it's a it's a net it's a net savings for the the school district. So, but like I said, I have to abstain. Well, I asked Mr. Tepfer to to go through the benefits of, of belonging to that organization because there was a uh, district lately that was considering not paying their, their fee and joining the organization, and uh, that person was uh, not listened to, and they did it. And I can tell you, I. I very frequently call the Ohio School Boards Association and they've, uh, I'm an attorney, but they've got school law attorneys and they really know what they're doing and uh, it's been wonderful guidance and they've helped us on a lot of different issues and it's, it's well worth the money that we pay for that membership. Um, any other discussion? It's kind of an obscure number. The, the 7,296. based on uh, enrollment. Okay. And it uh, seems like there's some other factor in there. Mr. Taffer? Mr. Hamilgarn? Yes. Dr. Heitz? Yes. Mrs. Bissinger? Yes. Mr. Smith? Abstain. Mr. Fruman? Yes. And the treasurer's report? Yeah, no, item um, A, we have the donations for December. Um, a big item this, this month is the uh, furniture from the Nagel Middle School PTA, over $36,000. So we value um, all of our partners. Um, but this month, we really value them. <laughs> um, the, um, in item B, we have a statement of board accounts. Um, Fund 516 has a negative balance. We're actually waiting for some money to come in, but the, the criteria for that has been met. Um, item uh, C is our uh, uh, general fund receipts, almost 50%. We're at the, fifth, uh, at the halfway point, so that's a good thing. 49.86 of our projected revenue. Uh, D&E show our expenditure patterns for this year. Um, those are in line with where we've been at this time uh, previously. Um, month, monthly bank reconciliation F, uh, investments G, no amendments to the appropriations this month. Um, item, um, we have our board service fund. We're requesting approval of board service fund expenses. And lastly, we're uh, establishing a new student activity fund uh, at Anderson High School. It's recommended 
the board approve the treasurer's report as presented. So moved. Second. I'd like to point out once again our investment report. $1.5 million in investment has a total interest of $28.42. Not a lot. Let's fix the roof. Yeah. Mr. Tepper? Mrs. Bissinger? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Dr. Heiss? Yes. Mr. Hamelgarn? Yes. Mr. Freeman? Yes. Uh, reports to the Board of Education. Here's the Business Advisory Committee report. Mr. Tepper? I uh, do not have a meeting between our last meeting. Our next meeting is the 3rd of February, 7 o'clock. We plan to talk about uh, a lot of comparative analysis that we have, um, obviously some facility discussions that we have, um, as well as the communications um, publication that the district's working on. So lots of good topics. Um, welcome to join us. Thank you. Uh, next is the Forest Hills Foundation for Education report. Uh, I will provide that report. Um, they're running a number of programs, the first of which is uh, they have the ACT, ACT preparation class. There will be another class in March. If you're interested, I assume contact uh, the foundation, D. Stone. Uh, destination Imagination. Uh, teams are meeting now and the regional competition will be uh, on March 8th at Nagel. Um, after school tutoring continues at Nagel every Tuesday and Thursday. Uh, there's about 40 to 50 kids uh, per session, so it's, it's very well attended. And thank you very much to the foundation for continuing to sponsor that. Uh, February 22nd at Nagel is a date for today's woman. Um, Registrations open on the foundation website, or you can pick up forms at the district office. Uh, I've never been, but I've heard. <laughs> um, the alumni basketball game is Saturday, March 1st, at Anderson. If you're interested in blowing out your knee and providing uh, some work for Dr. Heiss, go ahead and sign up for that. And for the first time, they're going to have female players. Um, I don't know why that's the first time. Uh, at halftime, they're going to. Uh, if, if you're going to uh, interested, just contact. Let's see, um, the foundation for that, and then Frank Brandy will be honored for his 20th year as car uh, career at the head coach at Anderson Basketball. Uh, the Forest Hills 5K is Saturday, May 10th. Uh, they're all practicing now in this cold, I'm sure, and uh, the annual campaign continues. I guess it was. Um, in earnest at the end of the year, but there's a second phase that's beginning in February. That's the update. Uh, next legislative liaison report, Mr. Smith. Can you pass that out? Thank you. Um, there are a number of things that have been uh, addressed by the House and Senate uh, Education Committee, but I think the most significant of them is House Bill 193. Uh, there they passed before the Christmas break. Uh, the House Committee adopted 27 amendments to the House Bill 193. Uh, some of the key things in that bill were delaying online assessments until 2015-16, uh, delaying the phase out of the OGT, um, and so there are some other things that are in the, uh, the, ha the House Committee uh, bill that have not been acted on yet, but those are things that uh, will impact us. I gave you the whole list because there's some interesting things in there, but like I said, those are the two key things that I think would impact us. Unless uh, Dallas or uh, Rick, you've got anything you want to add, uh, <coughs> that's that's what's going on. Thank you. Uh, saga report, Ms. Bissinger? Yes, um, I went uh, for the board on January the 14th and uh, it was, uh, attendance was a little down, I think, because it was cold. <laughs> and uh, let's see, there's a new coalition in, uh, for substance abuse, to combat substance abuse, in Marymount and Terrace Park called the Warrior Coalition. Uh, on February the 18th, data will be back from the Pride Student Survey. Uh, it basically talks about students' attitudes and usage um, toward um, alcohol and drugs. Uh, the data will be forwarded to the consultant for evaluation and he will attend the March 11th meeting to report. Um, parent survey was on, uh, they said at the time would be online this week, which was uh, a week ago, and I got mine and I hope you all got yours and it only takes a little bit. I'm not sure if they survey, it, it comes by email, I'm not sure if all parents are surveyed or just certain, a certain segment, certain, a certain amount, but um, it takes, it's very quick. Um, it probably took me three minutes to fill out. Uh, next week, 
I'm sorry, next meeting, the Ohio Investigative Unit uh, is having a speaker come, and his name is John Burton. And he will talk about uh, retailers ensuring there's no sales to mi minors. I assume that that's alcohol related. Um, what else? They are working on the March 25th, 2014 High School Youth Summit. Uh, it's, it's basically dedicated to listening to what students have to say about uh, um, usage in Anderson Township. 40 students are chosen per school. It's random, uh, 10 students for each grade. They're talking about changing the emphasis a little bit such that students will walk away with some message to take back to the schools. And the very last thing is that they are so glad to have us attending and mm -hmm. they thanked us for coming so whoever's going in March yeah <laughs> whoever's going in March have fun thank you sure um, executive session. oh that's me um, I move that we go into executive session for the appointment employment dismissal discipline promotion demotion or compensation of public employee or official or the investigation of charges or complaints against a public employee official licensee um, regulated individual or student unless the employee official licensee regulated individual or student requests a public hearing um, is that the only reason um, also item five thank you and to discuss matters required to be kept confidential by federal law federal rules or state statutes second, second. mr. Taffer Mrs. Bissinger? Yes. Dr. Heiss? Yes. Mr. Hemelgarn? Yes. Mr. Smith? Yes. Mr. Freeman? Yes. Um, we don't expect to have any business after executive session. Our next meeting is actually the work session I referenced earlier on February 8th, uh, Saturday morning at 8 a.m. And the next regularly scheduled board meeting is February 24th at 7 p.m. Thank you all.